Ik. Welcome to Locked On College Football Kickoff Live. Alongside Alex Dono of Locked On Canes and Kenton Gibbs of Locked On ACC and Locked On Wolfpack, Drake Toll here from Locked On Big 12. Thank you for making Locked On College Football Kickoff Live your lunchtime listen every Friday. Guys, let's jump in. The biggest upset of the week, at least in the top 10, Clemson and Duke. You might remember that I said if Clemson loses to Duke, I would cut off. I think it was my left. Kenton, was it my left pinky toe? Uh, I don't. Re- you didn't specify which pinky okay. toe. You just okay. said you would cut off a pinky toe. You did specify the tool, however. You said it, it wasn't was, going to uh, be a clean, sight. Clean you said scalpel, it wasn't going right? to be a butcher's knife. It was going to be a rusty knife. A well, rusty knife. Ken, a man of my word, I am ah. down one pinky toe this week. <laughs> After say, and I don't know how many toes I'm gonna. I, well, actually, I do. I have ten that I can give away this year. But I'm uh-huh. down one after week uh-huh. one, so I'm gonna have to start limiting my toe talk. Clemson Kenton gets it, gets just mauled by Duke, yeah. and Davo yeah. Sweeney says in response, "I like what our offense did. If we do it every week, we go undefeated." Um, I'm not sure what Dabo is on, but I will have all of it. Kenton Gibbs. Duke gets killed by uh, Duke kills Clemson. Uh, so I'll say this, um, you know, uh, first of all, a little dad joke for you all. I'm sure that your favorite uh, country music singer now is Toby Keith. But with that being said, uh, let's let's stick that to the facts. That was totally uncalled for. Let, let's, let's stick to the facts of this thing, though. Let's stick to the facts of this thing, because I, I warned you that this could happen. But more importantly, I think that that we need to start drug testing coaches in the NCAA. We need to stop just testing the players. It's high time that some of these coaches get in on it too because in what world is what their offense did acceptable? And don't get me wrong, they had over 400 yards of total offense. They won. They didn't turn over the ball a ton, but they turned it over in key moments. Phil Moffa's fumble at, when they're driving and looking like they can finally make this thing a game, a big-time deal. At the end of the game, that interception, when the game was kind of – out of hand or inconsequential was another thing, but that's indicative of the fact that all game, your passing game was out of sync. All game, you could hit nothing deep. There were no 20 yards or more air yardage plays for Clemson last week. So if you want your offense to do that, if you want your offense to do that, I'm sure the rest of the ACC is screaming, yes, Dabo, please give us that offense. Give us that because we, we've we been waiting on Clemson to give us an offense like that. We have been waiting for just this moment. It is it. Yeah, Dono, as the host of Locked on Canes, Clemson comes to you. Um, that is October 21st. And I'm guessing after seeing this offensive performance, you are shaking based on what the Tigers are bringing to town. I never thought I'd say this, but I'm actually happy this year that Clemson is on Miami's schedule and Duke isn't. Yeah. That's how I'm feeling about this. Now, as far as Dabo Sweeney goes, it's not just his post-game comments, fellas. Yeah. I don't think there's any other coach right now in college football who is as disconnected from reality as Dabo Sweeney. I mean, his comments after the game, his attitudes towards name, image, and likeness just go to show you that maybe he's not someone equipped to, to be in this era of college football. His attitudes toward recruiting as well. You know, Clemson has this policy where they don't like verbal commits to take visits to other places and they you know threaten to pull your offer if you do that it's like you have to wonder if the game is passing Dabo but I think he's still a fine football coach he's just a lot of the other stuff that comes with it and listen um right now obviously the stock is is falling for Cade Klubnik who didn't have the sort of season debut that people expected under center for Clemson meanwhile Riley Leonard now uh, for Duke, I think he's going to become more of a household name. You see what a dual threat he is with all the rushing yards and touchdown that he put up in that game. Um, but listen, I if I try to parse through Dabo's words, um, obviously there are big time execution things that you would think Clemson can clear up in the future because yeah. it was an absolute horror show in the red zone for them. Right. You, you have four red zone trips where you come away with zero points. I can see why he said this was the strangest game I've ever coached in. Like we've lost games before, but this is the strangest one. You wouldn't expect to go 0 for 4 in the red zone, zero points in those trips with the turnovers and the block field goals of that. You don't expect that to happen again. But at the same time, despite putting up more yards, they were not the better team on the field last week. Duke was. 
No, and it wasn't the biggest game of the week, but I'd call it the most consequential game of the week with Clemson losing to Duke, especially the way that Clemson did. However, this week, you turn the page to a loaded, loaded week, two that is led off with Alabama hosting Texas, a top 15 matchup in, matchup in Tuscaloosa. And Luke Robinson of Locked On Bama joins us here on Locked On College Football kickoff right now. Luke, my man, Alabama and Texas. Last week, the Longhorns were sloppy against Rice. Alabama took care of business. Jalen Milrow, the new quarterback, stepped up big time and showed that, hey, there's, there's a new signal caller in Tuscaloosa. How did you grade his performance, and is that good enough to beat a Longhorn team at home this week? Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me. Secondly, yeah, I think if he performs like that, it's, it's certainly enough to beat Texas. Um, Alabama is still – uber talented and uh, I know Texas is too but Alabama in terms of blue chip ratio if you believe in that type of stuff and I do uh, they are up there at, at number one or number two in terms of blue chip ratio so you know they've got the talent to do it I think what was so great was Jalen Milrow's command of everything look everybody was judging him on the way he performed against Texas A&M last year. And let me preface all that by saying his performance against A&M wasn't bad. He was forced into a starting role in what many people thought at the beginning of the season would be Alabama's biggest game, night time in Bryant-Denny against A&M, a revenge game. It was a big deal. And he was forced into duty. He ended up throwing three touchdowns. He had yeah. some turnovers. There's no doubt about it. He had some turnovers and he had some shaky moments. But Alabama won the game and he performed admirably. It wasn't a superb effort. It wasn't Bryce Young, but I've been on record saying, hey, I could call Bryce Young the best player in Alabama history. I mean, I, I don't think that's a stretch. Yeah. So, I, look, whoever followed Bryce Young is going to be a problem. But, you know, Jalen Milrow put on a show on uh, last Saturday against Middle Tennessee. He accounted for five touchdowns. That's never been done by an Alabama quarterback before. Uh, so pretty unbelievable. And, um, yeah, it's – it's uh, or at, I should say three passing touchdowns, two rushing touchdowns, never yeah, been done yeah, before. Yeah. But um, regardless, um, I, I think that's enough to beat Texas. And the su the uh, subplots here, where he was once committed to Texas, he's from Texas. Steve Sarkeesian coached at Alabama. Uh, Jace McClellan is from Texas. Just the rivalry, the, the idea that they're coming into the league. Alabama and Texas have played for a national championship in recent years. I mean, there, there's just a lot – to digest here. And the fact that they're going head to head on so many other recruits is a big deal as well. So I, we don't have anybody from the Longhorns coming on this episode, at least. So I need you to speak for both teams right now. Bama wins. If Longhorns win, if talk to me, um, I think Bama wins. If they play about as well as they did against middle Tennessee. I mean, I think if I, if both teams play an a game, I think Alabama wins. Um, if Alabama, uh, has a lot of turnovers. If they if they play like they played against Texas A&M as a whole, I'm not just uh, picking on Jalen Milrow. I think they could easily lose this game. And look, everybody points to last year where Quinn Ewers was picking Alabama apart, and that's true. They were doing that in the first quarter. But injuries are a part of the game. I think everybody could have a what if so and so wouldn't hurt in whatever game. Yeah. That's a part of it. Um, but I think Alabama wins if they just if they play their game, if they go out there and establish the run. And look, here's what I was so encouraged about last week that the, the questions I had about this Alabama team, I felt like a lot of them were answered. The, you know, the quarterback play, the wide receivers, they had been uh, – there had been a lot of rumors that they had been dropping a lot of passes in practice. They didn't have a single drop in that game. Um, and the, the things that I thought I knew, the offensive line, very good. The running backs, very good. They didn't perform – as well, Jalen Milrow led the team in rushing with 48 yards. That's a little odd. Um, but I know, I do know that those two uh, unit rooms are better than they played. So if they step up their game just a little bit, and as long as they're in a huge drop off in Milrow and the receivers and, and the defense, I feel like Alabama is going to win this thing. Now, conversely, um, the way Texas is going to win this game is by blocking out all the noise. I mean, if they come in and, and um, they can force Alabama into some situations they don't want to be in, a lot of third and longs, I think that Texas can win this game. That's going to be very difficult. And I'm going to tell you, as an Alabama fan, I have no problem admitting this. I mean, we've got uh, Alex here. He's from Miami. He knows, he knows what I'm about to talk about. Sometimes our home field advantage, though Nick Saban is 102-8 uh, in Tuscaloosa, 
isn't the same advantage as other places. I know Miami is sort of the same way. Look, you always think about playing Miami at home. Oh, it's so rough. Well, they don't usually have the same crowd unless it's a huge game. And when it is a huge game, that place gets bonkers. And that's going to be the way this is at Tuscaloosa. My co-host on Locked Open Bama, Jimmy Stein, lives in Tuscaloosa. And he said the atmosphere around the campus has been bananas. And it, that's not typical because we're so used to winning every game in Tuscaloosa that we sort of take it for granted, but this is not going to be one of those instances. You mentioned Luke coaching matchup is one of the bigger subplots. You know, Sark going up against Saban and, you know, former Saban assistants are just two and 28 against Nick. Uh, in, in this case, it's obviously an interesting one because Sark is an offensive guy. Saban's focus is more on the defense. So uh, how do you think Steve Sarkeesian is going to try to attack Bama's defense? Cause if nothing else, he probably knows, you know, which plays Saban doesn't like going up against in practice. Yeah, I think he's – look, Texas needs to try and take some deep shots. I think that's the way you can you can really uh, mess Alabama up a little bit. I think that you can get in their heads defensively if you can take some deep shots. The problem is with that – I and this is something I learned just doing some homework this week. Quinn Ewer's longest pass, at least last year, and I think in his career at Texas, is like 49 yards – and that just seemed crazy to me. I mean, because you think of Texas, you think of them uh, with Quinn Ewers and having Xavier Worthy and all these other uh, superstar receivers, you think they'd be throwing 80-yard bombs every game. And that's not really what they do. So it's just a little bizarre to me. But I think that, look, everybody seems to be so scared of Kool-Aid McKinstry. And they should be. He's the best defensive back in college football, best cornerback in college football, if you ask me. Now, but I think what you have to do is say, I'm going to go right at your best, and I'm going to see what he's got. And look, it may not work out. That may not be the best thing. But if, if it does work out, and if you can get ahead of Alabama by, say, two scores and sort of keep it that way for a while and force it where Alabama is going to have to go more into a passing game and especially an intermediate passing game because Jalen Milrow, two of his completions, he didn't have a lot of incompletions uh, last week, but two of his incompletions were in that intermediate stretch uh, and he didn't throw a lot in that uh, window. He either went deep or he went kind of short or he took off with the ball. So if you can force Alabama to try and uh, go to that intermediate passing game, I think that's huge for Texas. That's Luke Robinson of Locked On Bama, Alabama, and Texas, our game of the week here on Locked On College Football Kickoff Live. Luke, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it, guys. Absolutely. All right, boys, that was the game of the week this week. Last week, it was TCU and Colorado. We didn't know what was going to happen in that yet. You had LSU and Florida State, and then obviously that Duke and Clemson game. But we honed in on how Colorado was going to get dominated by TCU, and we were a little bit wrong. Kevin Borba of Locked on Buffs is going to join the show. Coming up next, Dono. Did you know that 80% of men will experience hair thinning in their lifetime? I'm very much among that 80%. It's normal, but my fate doesn't have to be your fate. You can get ahead of thinning hair with Nutrafol, my friends. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement. It's clinically shown to improve your hair growth, visible thickness, and visible scalp coverage. Go to Nutrafol.com slash men to take their hair health wellness quiz. You can identify the causes of your thinning hair and Nutrafol will give you a personalized plan for better hair health through whole body wellness. Take that first step to visibly thicker, healthier hair because for a limited time, Nutrafol is offering our listeners $10 off your first month subscription and free shipping when you go to Nutrafol.com slash men and enter promo code Locked On College. Find out why over 4,000 healthcare professionals recommend Nutrafol for healthier hair. Nutrafol.com slash men. It's spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com slash men and enter promo code Locked On College. That's Nutrafol.com slash men, promo code Locked On College. Believe it or not, two weeks ago, I was as bald as Dono. Dono took the hat there. I was wearing hats all the time, and then bam, neutral. Look, another guy who's in that same boat, locked on buffs, Kevin Borba. You're going to see it. You're about to see it. He is right now with one of our, our biggest upsets last week. What's up? <laughs> Kevin, there's the hair. Dude, Colorado, I, I told you. We, we had a lot of conversations last week. I told you this Colorado team is going to lose by three touchdowns four touchdowns, maybe more against TCU. But what blew me away is that Deion Sanders took 70-plus curated players from the transfer, not random guys, curated players from the portal, and won. Have we entered the era of AAU in college football 
as displayed on Saturday by Colorado? Um, I'll say people will try it, but I don't know if everybody has the effect that Deion Sanders does. Um, I think there's probably maybe 10, 15 coaches in college football that could realistically empty out the cupboard and then restock it with as much talent as he did. And I don't know if those coaches would even want to do it. Um, I think it'd be like Kirby Smart, Nick Saban. um, If Dabo Sweeney ever wanted to touch a transfer portal or or acknowledge that it's real, maybe he could do it. But um, I don't think everybody could do it. I don't think it's something that applies to everybody. Uh, I know Texas State kind of did it. um, But again, it's really not a one size fits all type of thing. And so I think having Coach Prime is kind of the main factor that a lot of these kids went there. Well, Kevin, I want to give a nod to Coach Prime right now because I bought receipts too, baby. Of all the folks on Locked On College Football Live, who was highest on the bus? I was. I believed in the bus. I said that their ceiling was higher than what everybody else believed. So, Coach Prime, I believe, okay? I don't have nobody else to tell you. I believe. Now, with that being said, Kevin, what do you think is the balance between the coaching and the talent that created that upset. Because me personally, the more I watch film on that game, the more I say, these young men were exceptionally coached. This game was schemed up perfectly. He beat Sonny, Prime beat Sonny Dykes in the chess game of football at multiple points. That's what I was seeing on tape at least. So tell me, what do you think is the balance there? Yeah, I think it's, I probably go 60 40. Um, honestly, I think the schematics were great. Um, I've never seen an offensive coordinator receive as much hype as Sean Lewis did, but he deserved all the praise. Um, every play he drew up was to perfection. It seemed like he was kind of, he would just take a look at the defense and be like, okay, we're running this. And then it would be wide open every single time is kind of what it felt like. I think Colorado scored just about every time they touched the ball. So you have to give him props where props is due. But then, you have to look at plays where I think it was like fourth and long, whatever that, I think it was 19. And Shadur Sanders scrambles a little bit and delivers a strike. Or you have to look at the the throws that he made down the field, his deep ball, I think, and I'm starting a little petition for this, so if you guys would like to sign. Um, I think Shadur Sanders throws the best deep ball in college football, or at least one of them. Um, and we saw on multiple occasions, um, he would hit guys down the sideline in stride. You guys had your previous guys was talking about Quinn Ewers. Quinn Ewers hasn't been able to hit the deep ball in his college career. Shadur Sanders has already shown that he throws – arguably the best deep ball in college football. And so I think it's the coaches deserve, deserve some praise, but the players executed. Um, you can only call things that they can execute. And so I think everybody deserves a lot of praise. Now, Kevin, unlike uh, Kenton, I, I was not a believer in the buffs last week or this season. They're now only one victory away from matching my season prediction. So I'm, I'm probably going to be eating some crow this season. So yeah, my two thoughts watching that win over TCU, number one, how wrong I was. But then number two, I'm watching Travis Hunter and I'm thinking, this guy could win the Heisman, right? You, you talk about non-quarterbacks winning the Heisman, two-way player. Hunter played 129 snaps last week. Can he keep up a pace like that through 12 games? Yeah, that was kind of my biggest question, too, because I think it was somewhere in the first half. He seemed a little tired or maybe just wasn't making the plays that he dropped a diving touchdown. Um, he it, Something else happened where every, all my friends and everybody who was watching the game as well is like, is he tired? And I was like, it kind of looks like it, but – after the game, he said he could play another game that day. So I think it's just a matter of him keeping him fresh at all times. I don't know if they're going to try to keep him out for all 150 snaps every single game, but why would you not? If he if he says he's ready to go, I think you got to trust him. Um, I think he's a, a playmaker. He's a difference maker. Um, I think the biggest play that stands out was a diving interception. Um, I saw somewhere that he covered about like six yards <laughs> on that play where he dove to catch the ball, and I think – um, when you look at that play, you're like, why would Chandler Morris throw it that way? Well, Travis Hunter was nowhere near where Chandler Morris was trying to throw it. That's just how quickly he covered ground. And so Travis, Travis Hunter needs to be on the field as much as possible. Um, I do think the Heisman the Heisman hype is legit. Um, if he plays like this every week, I don't see why he shouldn't at least be in New York um, at the very minimum. Um, I don't think we've ever seen someone who has this kind of effect on both sides of the ball. Um, his stats for Char- – his stats for receiving have already essentially surpassed Charles Woodson. If everything goes right, he'll pass Charles Woodson by tomorrow. So Travis Hunter is that guy, and it's only been 13 days of college football. <laughs> yeah. So so do we go with uh, Travis Otani or or do we uh, go with uh, Shohei Hunter? Which one do you prefer? That's a, that's a good one. I, li- I like Travis Otani. Got to get the mm-hmm. first name in there. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I enough. love it. That's Kevin Borba of Locked On Buffs. Borba, thanks for joining us. Thank you.
Guys, uh, to the rest of the desk, a, a Colorado win that to me proves the transfer portal is right there. You, you see Texas State do it with 53 transfers and beating up on Baylor and Colorado gets TCU. There have been teams who have tried this AAU style and now it's coming with more success. Dono, to me, I would rather have 30 juniors from Western Kentucky mm-hmm. as opposed to 30 four-star freshmen coming out of high school. Where do you sit here? Well, I'm with you because any coach I talk to agrees with you. Experience in this game is so important. Um, And again, uh, Colorado just had so many. They have so many. I didn't think they'd be able to put it together as quickly as they can. That's a testament to coaching, right? I mean, Coach Prime and his staff, you've got to get everybody uh, in sync and running in the same direction. And they clearly were able to do that throughout spring and fall. I mean, probably a lot of the guys that came in weren't even there for spring football. They added some more before fall camp. So it's a pretty impressive undertaking. But uh, I think sometimes people undervalue the idea that if you have a team that's laden with juniors and seniors, even if they come from smaller programs, even if they come from, you know, Jackson State, obviously a lot of guys who came over with Dion, that it's just such an advantage instead of having to rely on some 18 year old true freshmen and red shirt yeah. freshmen to be able to have a team with more experience like that. And uh, I think this is a great experiment. I think others are now going to try to overhaul the roster the way that prime did and probably not find the same kind of immediate success. Cause it is such a difficult potion and balance, but this is definitely a, a powerful example of how that can work in this era. Kent and I was shocked when Prime pointed out a beat reporter after the game and said, you didn't believe in us. And there was a yeah. long pause and he said, you still don't believe in us. Yeah. Uh, Kenton, you were you were the only semi believer last week of this panel. I still I don't think you had Colorado going to the playoff or even no, putting on no. that kind of a show. No. Did they still impress you despite the expectation you had? So here's the thing. I don't. I still don't have them as a playoff team. Now that I will not go that far. I will be on there right now. Is saying I don't think that their defense is quite there yet. I don't think they're quite there in the trenches. Um, but with that being said, they did. I expected that game to be closer than what most people were saying. I expected it to be closer than three touchdowns. And I'll tell you this much: TCU last year lived on the edge with that. Hey, we're going to give up a ton of points, but. This is a Sonny Dykes led team. And Sonny Dykes ain't never had a problem scoring the football. That's never been a thing that you look at with a Sonny Dykes coach team and say, man, they could just get into the end zone. They'd be great. Never. So, um, you know, them putting up the performance that they did offensively and winning this game, that was a little surprising to me. But I want to I want to touch just for a second on what you were talking about with the uh, transfer portal versus yeah. the, the, the high school players. The player that scored four touchdowns out of the backfield for them, Dylan Edwards, a freshman out of high school. Yeah, this yeah, thing is yeah. more art than science. There is no precise balance to say like, hey, I'd rather have this than that, or this is the, the way to do this thing. Because, I mean, if you look at the programs that are having the most success by far and wide, right, it's not that AAU style. It's a no. mix between, yes, we, we do have a bit of a farm system in it. Hey, you're the best player at Kent State? Come on down here to Alabama, buddy. We, yeah. we got big time football for you to play over here. And also saying, hey, we're also going to get the best players out of high school. We're going to get every five-star we want. And when we don't, if that five-star don't pan out, brother, we'll get rid of you and go get that wide receiver from Washington State who's begging for a quarterback who can throw the 40 yards. Let me just add in one thing also about this game, just to be fair, because, of course, you know, the way Colorado did it, they look so flashy. And now, you know, their their home opener is going to be lit against Nebraska this weekend. So, you know, all the narrative has been praising Dion and praising Colorado. They deserve it. okay? but on the flip side. Did anyone tell Sonny Dykes you are allowed to play defense, uh, right? Uh, because that mm-hmm. that was yeah. one of the more ghastly displays yeah. defensively. And and what got me thinking about that was Kenton hit the nail on the head when you talk about these, you know, last year's TCU or Sonny Dykes team. You think we don't really, you know, we're going to outscore whoever we play, okay? Well, at some point, you've got to stop somebody. And, and I know their defense was better last year en route to uh, the college football playoff final. So, I'm also going to be watching TCU for the rest of the season with a fine-tooth comb to see if their defense doesn't get better because that was pretty embarrassing. Were, yep. were they better last year? Were they? I, I'm not Defensively, sure. Defensively, yeah. I think gave so. Up 34 to, gave up 34 to SMU, 31 to Kansas, 40 to Oklahoma uh, State. Hey, yeah, 30- Hodges Tomlinson, though, was maybe the best, maybe the best guy in the secondary in, in the country. I, and listen, they had pieces that were good. As a collective last year, that defense was – uh, living on a prayer. I don't want to sing because I remember uh, last week they got over for singing, but I was going to sing the <laughs> we're halfway there. But them, them boys were really living on the wing and a prayer in terms of defensively last year at times. So that's just my thought. You know, yeah. I don't want to go too deep into it. 
Yeah, it's funny that TCU hires a guy with the last name Bryles and loses the first game with him on the sidelines. Karma is real, and it starts with Bryles. Guys, I, I look, playoff conversation is way too early here. It's September, but did you know only one team has made the playoff with a September loss, and no team has done it while going 0-1 in Week 1? Certainly not a good sign for Texas Tech. Red Raiders losing to Wyoming on the road. And for Oregon, you can't afford a loss outside of Pac-12 play when you're in a conference like the Pac-12. How will this game play out? Oregon and Texas Tech. Spencer McLaughlin of Locked On Ducks and Chris Level of Locked On Texas Tech got together to discuss. Two tidbits that have been making me resistant to the notion that some Oregon fans have, you know, kind of bought into, which is, oh, well, if they lost to Wyoming, certainly they're going to lose to lose to the Ducks and it's not going to be close and everything Two two tidbits on that front. Number one, I've brought this up on on the show before, but Oregon in 2021 Lost to a three and nine Stanford team, also beat Ohio State on the road. Same team, same season, couple weeks apart. There are peaks and valleys, and the great teams have their valleys still result in wins. And maybe in the case of like a Georgia or you know Alabama, some years those valleys are just less dominant wins than what they are uh, accustomed to. That's what great teams and programs do. But no team plays their best football every week. That was not the best version of football. I think that Texas Tech is going to play in in 2023 and another good example is utah 2021 same year they began the season one and two they lost and this will provide some hope to texas tech fans they lost a triple overtime thriller to san diego state in the non-conference they were a one and two football team they ended up winning the pac-12 that year thumping oregon twice in a two-week span so it was not what the Red Raiders were hoping for. It's not what I expected to see from them for sure. But in no way, Chris, do I feel that this is now just a giant mismatch between one team that won 81-7 to against an FCS opponent in Portland State and one team that blew a 17 to nothing lead on the road against Wyoming. Yeah, you know, and, and unfortunately for Texas Tech, th- this is a fan base that's been tortured by – you know, back when Spike Dykes, you know, uh, Sonny Dykes' dad was the coach here, you, you were notorious for one week you lose to North Texas, a little old school up in Denton right outside the Metroplex. You, you lose to them on your home turf. And then fifth-ranked A&M would show up uh, on your field, and you're thinking, oh, well, this isn't going to go up. And then you pull it <laughs> off and win. Yeah, It's like – I say this all the time. It's like, I know what you're capable of, but I also know what you're capable of. And so like, what you know, and, and like, you're right. There's very few teams that even that out and, and like survive all the tests. And I, I expect this to be a fun home crowd. I think, you know, if you're tech, you can get a lot of the doubt back and erased if you get a win here and you can kind of get a fresh start on it. Let's get out of here on this, Chris, and I'll see if I can uh, kind of, wriggle this out of you uh, of sorts a prediction on on the game um i know you're not always pain spencer yeah right (laughs) tortillas will fly i'll predict that i i was about to say i'm very much looking forward to what i'm calling the quad t in college football the texas tech tortilla toss i think is an excellent way to describe what's what's going to happen for those of you who don't know there is a tradition at texas tech where they throw tortillas at tick at kickoff because, well, uh, Chris, real, real quick, in like 30 seconds or less, why do you throw tortillas on the field in Lubbock? I love it, by the way. It's quintessential college football traditions. Back in the day, I think that Texas Tech was playing Texas A&M. Some announcer popped off and said "There's the only thing in Lubbock is a, is a giant tortilla factory <laughs> or something along those lines. And so I think people kind of caught on to it. it. It pissed them off. So at kickoff, they just they, they they let them fly. They freeze them. They cut holes in them so they'll fly further. Um, they used to get penalties. Oh, they freeze them. Oh, goodness. Oh, yeah, so they it, got a little. It, they make them a little further. oomph. Oh yeah, but they're flour tortillas, and yeah, it's only at kickoff though. Oh, they, corn's they, they better. They go everywhere. Yeah, corn is, I, for, from a taco standpoint, a thousand percent agree. Corn is not, the corn. Corn is much better. At, not for throwing them at kickoff. Okay, I yeah. I completely agree. Uh, I I think Oregon goes into Texas Tech. And, and gets it done. I've got Oregon winning 34 to 23. Your thoughts on the outcome of the game? 
I can't sit here and pick Oregon to win. I just can't do it. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm okay. sorry. I'll say That's 36, okay. 33. I'll, I'll channel my inner spike dykes and I'll say you come back, you know, from the grave. You're like the undertaker that just sits up. Oh, like he's still alive. Right. <laughs> um, and, and I'll say 36, 33. And then uh, everybody calms down in love. It's like, okay, well, we're one and one out of the gate, but it's not as bad as we thought, but we pull off a good one. But yeah. I'll say 36, 33. Boy, when 50% of your conversation is about tortillas, their history, and how to freeze them, you know you're in for an invigorating matchup this weekend. Glad that we got the insight from those two guys. And coming up, we've got Conference Confidential, where we'll take you all across the country to find out which games are the biggest. And stick around for Sell Me Why, right here on College Football Kickoff Live, Dono. Buying last-minute tickets to sporting events should not be stressful. Folks, I've been buying tickets day of events at game time. Flash deals and last-minute tickets, they've got the best ones at game time. Easy to find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area. That includes concerts. I'm taking my son to Disney on Ice tomorrow. Got my tickets at game time. Forget planning months in advance. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the day of. Get those exclusive flash deals, and the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of that difference. So download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Dono, I had no idea you were taking Dabo Sweeney to Disney on Ice this weekend. <laughs> uh, there are so many games around the nation that stand out in week two, folks. Let's get some more insight into the biggest games from our biggest conferences in this week's Conference Confidential. We start with Craig Scheman of Locked On Big Ten. There are 14 Big Ten games on the slate this weekend, and none bigger than Matt Rule and the Nebraska Cornhuskers going into Boulder, Colorado to take on Coach Prime Deion Sanders and the Colorado Buffaloes, who shocked the college football world last weekend by going into TCU and winning 45-42. Nebraska is coming off yet another one-score loss, this time to Minnesota, 13-10. Here's the deal. I think Nebraska's defense is much better than TCU's. I also think that Nebraska quarterback Jeff Sims and running back Gabe Irvin can run the football. I don't know if you noticed, but TCU ran for 262 yards against Colorado's defense. I think it's there for the taking. Bottom line, I think if this is a high-scoring game, some sort of shootout, then Coach Prime and Colorado are 2-0. and And who would have thought that a couple of weeks ago? If it's a lower scoring game with some actual defense in this game, I think Matt Rule gets his first win at Nebraska. By the way, Vegas has the over-under at 59, so it thinks it's going to be a little bit of a higher scoring game. They also have the buffs at minus three on this one. Youngstown State is at Ohio State. I call this the Jim Trestle Bowl, given his importance to both institutions over the years. Cal McCord and Devin Brown will both play quarterback for Ohio State. Devin Brown will play a lot more than he did last weekend in Bloomington against the Indiana Hoosiers. I've got to tell you right now, this quarterback situation is not resolved yet. So both will get a lot of snaps in this game. In Ann Arbor, get out your bingo card for your coaching roulette. We'll keep track of who's coaching the team. Jim Harbaugh in his second of three weeks being suspended. Of course, last week against East Carolina defensive coordinator Jesse Minter held down the fort. This week against UNLV, special teams coordinator Jay Harbaugh will handle the first half. Meanwhile, running backs coach Mike Hart will be the head coach in the second half. Got it? Got it. And finally, let's not overlook the Cyhawk Trophy as Iowa takes on Iowa State for the 70th time in this rivalry. It's going to be a great weekend. Can't wait. Enjoy the games. I'm Craig Scheman for Locked On Big Ten.
Week two in the college football world is upon us, and all eyes will be on Boulder, Colorado, as the Cornhuskers of Nebraska travel to take on Deion Sanders and the Buffs. Spencer McLaughlin here for Locked On Pac-12. A lot of great games across the Pac-12 non-conference slate this week. A lot of big opportunities, but perhaps none bigger than the chance for Colorado to progress towards a 3-0 and start before conference play begins on September 23rd at Oregon. They host USC the following week, and they have a chance to show that week one wasn't a fluke, that TCU isn't a pullback team in a major way, but that Colorado is just that good. Shador Sanders set a school record in his first game as a buff with 510 passing yards. He was darn near flawless, throwing four touchdowns, no interceptions, executed the offense at a really high level. The thing to watch in this game is Nebraska's offense against Colorado's defense. The Buffs allowed 42 points and needed two red zone turnovers of TCU in order to hold them to 42 points on the road. The a Nebraska offense, meanwhile, that managed just 10 points against Minnesota in week one. Is a weakened Buffs defense going to be exploitable for what appears to be a weak Nebraska offense? Or is the Buffs defense going to make strides from last week, their offense perform at a high level, and they end up winning the game? It's going to be a thriller either way. The homeowner opener for Coach Prime was always going to have a lot of interest and hype and intrigue. And somehow, with that week one win at then 17th ranked TCU, Colorado has upped the ante on how excited and interested we all are to watch the Buffs play in front of their home fans at Folsom Field this weekend. Don't sleep on other games across the Pac-12 like Auburn and Cal, Oregon, Texas Tech. Utah, Baylor, and how about Arizona State? Just a three and a half point underdog against Oklahoma State. Something smells a little bit fishy there, but should be a really, really good week in the Pac-12. And definitely don't forget Washington State hosting Wisconsin. A lot of great games and a lot of great opportunities for the Pac-12 as they look to stay undefeated in the non-conference slate in week two. Dave Schultz with your Week 2 Sunbelt Preview. Much better matchups across the board in the Sunbelt for Week 2. In fact, you have a conference ball game, the Louisiana Raging Cajuns taking on ODU in Norfolk, Virginia. First time these two schools have ever met. But the big matchup is Appalachian State going to Chapel Hill to take on Carolina. This is a rematch in last year's crazy ball game, 63-61 Tar Heels. But App State scores 40 points in the fourth quarter to fall short in overtime. But that, that leads to the victory over an A&M, which leads to game day in lovely Boone, North Carolina, which leads to a Hail Mary victory over Troy. You do have Joy Aguilar starting at quarterback. He came in for the injured Ryan Berger. Aguilar threw four touchdown passes on just 11 out of 13 uh, passing. But you also have the defense that's got to step up a little bit. Mountaineers gave up 24 points to Gardner-Webb. That's not going to fly against Drake May and company in Chapel Hill. Sunbelt teams playing three other Power 5 schools uh, this week. You do have James Madison going to Charlottesville. Virginia hosting their first ball game since the tragedy last year. And it's James Madison's first trip to Virginia in 40 years. James Madison also making a quarterback change. Alonzo Barnett, the third, just struggled last week against Bucknell. Senior transfer Jordan McLeod, he came in and he righted the ship as the Dukes beat Bucknell 38-3. to You got Troy going up against Kansas State and the Trojans, the defending Sunbelt champions, they struggled giving up 30 points to Stephen F. Austin. They're going to have to do a much better job to shock the Wildcats. And then you got Southern Miss. Poor Golden Eagles or look at it as a great opportunity. They get to go to Tallahassee to take on Florida State. The Seminoles destroying LSU in the second half. And can the Golden Eagles and the Fighting Will Halls pull off a shocker? The other big ball game in the Sun Belt, you got Texas State. The Bobcats upsetting Baylor. They're going into UTSA to take on the Roadrunners. If Texas State beats UTSA, do they start 4-0? and They got Jackson State and Nevada coming up. My goodness, G.J. Kinney is uh, shocking the Sun Belt uh, immediately. That's your week two preview in the Sun Belt. I'm Dave Schultz. Enjoy the Sun Belt football. That was our look around the country here on College Football Kickoff Live with Conference Confidential. Now, guys, it is time for Sell Me Why. Five or six games where we're going to tell you we, we can help sell some of these on why the spread is where it is and who's going to cover. We start with Ole Miss minus six and a half. 
Everybody oh. wants to see the SEC go down to a G5 opponent on the road. That is the consensus amongst other conferences in college football. But I just don't think it's going to happen. Hi, I'm Stephen Willis from the Locked On Ole Miss podcast. And you are looking at an Ole Miss offense that is operating at maximum efficiency. Willie Fritz and the Tulane Green Wave are going to have to perform at an extremely high level to keep Ole Miss off the board. This is a game that even as good as Tulane is defensively, could see Ole Miss scoring 40 or 50 points. And with the line being as small as it is, I don't think that Tulane's offense is going to be able to match it. In fact, whenever you look at the score of this game, I put it at somewhere around 31 to 14. So I would be be okay with laying up to 12 or 13 points. So as this line gets a little bit bigger, and I think it will before kickoff, I do think that I would lay these points. Tulane's a good football team. I just don't know if they're as good as Ole Miss. Yeah, guys, uh, Kenton Gibbs, we'll start with you. Ole Miss, Tulane, this game is a sellout. Uh, this it's a, a Tulane team that won a New Year's Six Bowl last year, but a lot of people are are picking are picking the the Rebels to get it done. Yeah. So the thing about this game is Tulane is another one of those teams, and this is kind of because they're in the group of five more so than just a philosophical thing that we see from a lot of Power Five teams that don't play defense. They're going to struggle defensively. The offensively, they can scheme guys up. They can find ways to get guys up. They can find what I. I enjoy watching Tulane's offense because whatever they want to do, they find ways to effectively do it. If they want to get the ball to the perimeter in terms of the running game, they find a way to do so. If they want to scheme up, hey, we're going to keep hitting you uh, laterally, laterally, laterally until all of a sudden you got two high safeties and now we can gash you vertically, they're going to do it. And so I could see I could see Tulane saying, hey, not today. No covering on us, Ole Miss. But I could also see a couple of turnovers going the wrong way for them and then all of a sudden – Old Miss gets this thing and makes it up. Dono, seven to seven point game. Do you take the Rebels? I do take the Rebels. Um, it gives me pause because obviously Tulane is ranked, Tulane is talented, but the fact that they're ranked, that means you're not going to be sleeping on the green wave. I think I look at it from an Ole Miss perspective because sometimes when you see these strong group of five teams pull off these upsets, I know we're talking about a spread, not the straight up, but either way, when you're talking about these group of five teams, when you can catch a power five sleeping, it's not going to happen because I think Tulane has enough hype coming in. Jimmy's and Joe's, guys, I mean, you know, Tulane can try to scheme with their X's and O's, but they just don't have the talent. So this is a situation where – I can see it being a close game heading into the fourth quarter, and I just think the Rebels are going to wear them out and probably end up winning this game by two touchdowns. Look, I a New Year's Bowl missed the cover, by the way. I New Year's yeah. Six Bowl is yeah. different than Week Two of college yeah. football, right? You, you don't really throw out the kitchen sink to beat Ole Miss this week, and maybe you can make the case that Tulane does, but they they know what it's like to win now. They they've seen that at the at one of the highest levels of college football. I've got Ole Miss by at least a touchdown. It's a weird line, right? Vegas and the betters are are swayed on this one, but I, give me Ole Miss as well. But we've got max in this weekend to an, an extent, like fifty percent max in Georgia, forty three and a half point favorites over the Ball State Cardinals. Clint Shamblin of Locked On Bulldogs is going to sell us why he, the dogs will cover the huge spread. Herbie, Clint Shaman, Locked On Bulldogs here, telling you why Georgia's going to cover no problem, no sweats against Ball State. One, Bobo knows his assignment. Look, last week, Kirby Smart got on him, told him, hey, uh, first and goal from the five, can't be having that. We got to get more than a field goal. That's number one. Bobo's going to be on point. Number two, Carson Beck is going to be just fine. In this offense, Setson Bennett did not have as many yards, completions, or touchdowns as Carson Beck did in his first game as Georgia's signal caller. No worries there. And number three, this defense is nasty. It's the best defense Kirby Smart has ever, yes, I said ever, had. Talent all across the board. Composite is the best we've ever seen, which is why I think Glenn Schumann and Kirby's going to shut them out again. This is why Bulldogs are going to cover that point spread. Fear not. Lay the points. It's just fine. Ball State is not going to score, and Georgia's going to get a 50-burger. That's why Bulldogs are going to cover. Oh, the old backdoor cover here. We're talking 43 points. Georgia did not cover that against UT Martin. What? There are so many other things you could do with your life than bet a three-point spread, Kenton Gibbs. I agree. I agree. I, this is throwing money out the window because you're, you're counting on a lot working in a certain way. 
they're counting on Kirby Smart not calling off the dogs. You're counting right. on the the twos and threes from Georgia not potentially letting up a touchdown or two because Mike New, who's the head coach of, of Ball State, he's not going to pull his starters. That's that's not going to happen. We have seen him historically get the wheels whooped off him by teams, and those starters play deep into that game. If you look at the Tennessee game last year, Tennessee beat him by 49 points, so I know some people are thinking that's for us who think Georgia is going to cover yeah. But not really, not so fast, my friend, because there were multiple moments toward the end of that game. Tennessee just kind of lucked into some moments, or not lucked into, but things went their certain way in terms of their twos and threes getting pick sixes and whatnot. That was like, oh, well, you know, this is this is how these things go. I'm never comfortable with a line above 40, just being completely honest. I'm never comfortable with that. So yep. I'll get Ball State saying, I, 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 not so fast, my friend. No soup for you, no cover for Georgia. I like it. Now, this next one here, we, we're going to go to the ACC, Kenton's ACC, as the Notre Dame Fighting Irish are seven-point favorites over the NC State Wolfpack. We've got Trevor Wojak of Locked on Irish to sell you why the Irish will cover. Hey, college football fans. I'm Tyler Wojak, the host of Locked on Irish for the Locked on Podcast Network. Today, I'm here to tell you why Notre Dame is going to cover the seven-and-a-half-point spread on the road against the NC State Wolfpack. Like always, it starts with the quarterback, and Sam Hartman has been practically unstoppable in his first two starts for the Irish, leading the offense to 11 touchdowns out of 12 total drives. I expect him to exercise some demons against NC State and have a big game on Saturday in Carter Finley Stadium. But it's not just Hartman, though. The Notre Dame defense has been stout, and they have yet to give up a touchdown through two games, albeit against pretty weak competition, but still, they have been really good so far. And I believe this is the first big test for Notre Dame this season, both offensively and defensively, and I'm confident the Irish are ready to rise to the challenge and get a statement win on the road against NC State. Our very own former NC State defensive tackle, Kenton Gibbs, go. Y'all are going to call me a homer. People are going to call me everything but a good Christian. They're going to say that I'm, I'm, I'm imploring people to give away money. But here's the deal. The Wolfpack and the Golden Domers have played three times. And Notre Dame has never won a game outright outside of South Bend. And by the way, those three games weren't 100 years ago. The, the most recent one was in 2017. They lost in 2016 when a hurricane was coming through Raleigh. NC State wins 10-3. Guess what? There's supposed to be another hurricane that is on the brink. Fans, friends, family, I'm telling you, this is deja vu for a reason. The more I watch film on Notre Dame, the more I believe they're not going to cover. Do I believe they went out right? I have them winning by a field goal, 24-21. But do they cover that seven and a half? Mm, I don't think so. Uh, well, speaking of games that are close to the chest for our host, Dono, here's yours. Texas a and Aggies are currently favored by three and a half on FanDuel over the Miami Hurricanes. Here's Andrew Stefaniak to tell you why the Aggies will cover that spread. Will Texas A&M cover against Miami? Man, it's a tough one. It's a good question. I think the Aggies are going to cover. Our friends over at FanDuel currently have the line at four and a half points, minus four and a half for the Aggies. And the way I look at it, I think they're going to go on the road and take care of business against the Miami Hurricanes. Texas A&M's offense looked dominant against New Mexico, and I think that they're going to go and do the same against a much better opponent in Miami. Connor Wigman was throwing passes that were just perfect, putting the ball right in the bucket, putting it right where it needed to be. We saw the wide receivers running open all game long, one of the most talented receiver rooms in college football. I think you're going to see that repeat itself. Texas a and hopefully going to have more of a rushing game against the Miami Hurricanes and the defense. I think it's going to come down to whether or not you can stop Miami's rushing attack. If you can do it, the Aggies win, and they cover the four-and-a-half-point line. Well, comparing backdrops between Locked On Canes and Locked On Aggies, Alex Dono covers. Do the Canes cover this Saturday? I think they do cover. And it, the magic number, I mean, it had been earlier in the week, three and a half. It's at four and a half. I think this game is going to be decided by three or four points in either direction. So I look at that number. I feel comfortable taking Miami. Um, Texas A&M hasn't had a great road record uh, under Jimbo Fisher in bigger games. And the big thing, I thought that Andrew, he hit the nail on the head when he was talking about stopping Miami's rushing attack because that's been an area where the Hurricanes have been completely revolutionized. Uh, you know, they've added 
three top tier offensive linemen since last year, Javion Cohen and Matt Lee in the transfer portal. It's funny because the Hurricanes actually have a true freshman starting at right tackle. And normally you'd say that's kind of a liability. But in the case of uh, Francis Maui Noah, former five star recruit out of IMG Academy, he's been blowing everybody away so far at his time at the U. And most importantly, Miami can basically go four deep with starting caliber running backs. And this is a time in the season when everybody, at least all those four, are still healthy right now. When you talk about rotating between Henry Parrish, Mark Fletcher, A.J. Allen, and Don Chaney Jr. And Texas A&M, as talented as their defensive line is, fellas, because they, they've got five stars all over the place, basically two deep. Uh, they were brutal against the run last season. Different coaches, a lot of the same personnel. And New Mexico had a little success running into the te into the teeth of their defense last week. So Andrew was right on. The Texas A&M stopping Miami's running game is a big key. I'll look at it on the flip side. As far as the Miami Hurricanes go, trying to slow down the Aggies passing game. That's going to be where Miami either covers that four and a half point spread or not, because that trio of wide receivers that the Aggies bring to the table with Evan Stewart, who was suspended against Miami last year, Noah Thomas, who's six foot six and Anaya Smith, who's just a gadget, you know, all purpose guy does a fantastic job. Miami's got to pressure their quarterback, Connor Wigman. And I believe the Hurricanes have a defensive line where they're able to do that, I think, on a somewhat consistent basis, make him feel a lot more uncomfortable than he did against New Mexico. Uh, I think this is going to be a good game, fellas. And I think, uh, you know, I, I did go on record picking Miami to win by three. It could obviously go the other way, but I think it's going to be close. I think this is going to be a three or four point game, and Miami does cover. So, not to be left out. I'm ready to be heard again. The Baylor Bears and the Utah Utes. Utah opened as a four-point favorite. It has now jumped to eight. It is doubled. Uh, I'll be in the house at 11 a.m. Central time between Baylor and the Utes with Kyle Whittingham. Give me, give me the Baylor Bears plus eight. They were terrible last week. They lost to Texas State. Who does that? Uh, one of the worst upsets in college football's recent memory for a Power 5 team. But I'll tell you this. Sawyer Robertson, a Mississippi State Mike Leach quarterback, is starting for Baylor this week. His high school coach, a storied high school coach in Texas high school football, came on our show on ESPN Central Texans and said, huh, this kid doesn't need an offensive line. He'll do it by himself. I think we got an old Tom Brady, Drew Bledsoe situation brewing in Waco. Baylor might lose by 45, but Sawyer Robertson might just win the game. That's why I like Baylor plus eight. That's a heart pick. You know, Kent Gibbs said he's not biased. I am Sawyer Robertson plus eight this week against the Utah Utes. Now, coming up next, the NCAA has done what the NCAA does best, and that's make terrible decisions that don't make any sense. This one comes from the ACC. But first, Dono. My friends, hair thinning does not have to be your future. Your fate doesn't have to be mine, guys. If you're tired of weakening or thinning hair, do you want to reach your full hair potential? Leading hair growth supplement, Nutrafol, helps improve your hair growth, visible thickness, and visible scalp coverage as well. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement, and it's clinically shown to improve your hair growth, visible thickness, and visible scalp coverage. Take the first step to visibly thicker hair and healthier hair. For a limited time, Nutrafol is offering our listeners $10 off your first month subscription and free shipping when you go to Nutrafol.com slash men and enter the promo code Locked on college, and you'll find out why over 4,000 healthcare professionals recommend Nutrafol for healthier hair. Nutrafol.com slash men, spelled N U T R A F O L dot com slash men. Enter promo code Locked on college. That's Nutrafol.com slash men, promo code Locked on college. Slowly approaching the noon Eastern hour here. This is Locked On College Football Live. That's Alex Dono. That's Kenton Gibbs. I'm Drake Toll, breaking down everything from last week in college football and everything coming up this week. Now, one of the biggest storylines from the NCAA in their very finite wisdom, they have denied UNC wide receiver Tez Walker his eligibility for the 2023 season, and Mac Brown was furious, rightfully so. Somebody else who's also not very happy about it, Isaac Shade of Locked On Tar Heels will take you there now. Breaking news. The committee reviewing UNC wide receiver Tez Walker's case has voted to deny the reinstatement of his eligibility, meaning that Tez Walker will not play for North Carolina this season. This comes a day after the NCAA's tone-deaf tweet about supporting student-athletes in their mental health. 
a biting statement coming out from head coach Mac Brown. Quote, I don't know that I've ever been more disappointed in a person, a group of people, or an institution than I am with the NCAA right now. Plain and simple, the NCAA has failed Tez and his family, and I've lost all faith in its ability to lead and govern our sport. In a quote from A.D. Bubba Cunningham, this decision undermines the fair treatment of student athletes and further erodes the public's confidence in our national governing body. So what's next? Will we see legal action? Will Carolina accept this news and move on? We'll find out. But on Saturday, the Tar Heels host App State and will do so without Tez Walker. Yeah, nothing shocking from the NCAA here, guys. This is something that's been an ongoing problem. I One thing that I, I like to mention, there was a tweet from the Baylor football account, who, again, I, I try to support, that said, starting year seven, one of their defensive guys starting year seven in what you got 25-year-old players who have gone to two or three different schools that are eligible to play for different teams, but Tez Walker can't play for UNC. Kenton Gibbs, not shocking, still abysmal. Yeah, again, the, the old meme. Disappointed, but not surprised, right? Yep. I mean, the, the reality is there are times where, especially with the NCAA, where the process, procedure, the way that rules are written and followed to the T are – they they just – they don't run concurrent with common sense. Yes, it does not make sense that guys are allowed to play seven, eight years, whatever the case may be. However, by the, the lay of the law, by the rule of the law, they got a couple of hardship waivers for whatever reason in terms of injuries or whatever the case may be. Yeah. And they got a COVID year maybe, which we're seeing the back end of guys with COVID years. That's finally starting to wane off a little bit, but we're seeing that as well. And then you combine that in with the fact that they're graduate transfers – Graduate transfers have an entirely different ball game in terms of where they can and can't go and how they can move than undergrad transfers. But in this Tez Walker situation in particular, the thing that I find so, so important about this, so disgusting about this, is the fact that his first transfer was away from a school that didn't have football that year. Mm. He committed to North Carolina Central out of high school. Yep. They canceled their season because of COVID. That should have been reason enough to say, hey, this doesn't count as his one free transfer. This is that it shouldn't be. Well, his grandmother is sick, and that's why. No, 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 no. Even if we're going by the 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 law of the land here, if that team did not participate in football when he came, why would he stay? With all due respect to NC State, I got my degree from there without having financial hardship. I just gave him three attendance, more than most people ever will. But that's another story for another time. The reality is very simple. Without football, I would have been in Raleigh. If when I got down here, they said, "Hey, Ken, um, COVID is happening." And we're not going to be playing football. Okay, y'all be real. You know, y'all stay easy. I'm not going. I, I'm in the words of Magic Johnson. I ain't going to be here. Okay, yeah. that would have been me. So it's. I think that it's it's flatly preposterous to look at that situation. Look at this young man and say, hey, that still counts as one of your transfers. That's mm -hmm. that's nonsensical. To me. Don, Donna, we're in an era, too, where anybody can transfer for anything. I don't know why we're picking and choosing these things where Colorado's got 73 players. The NCAA says nothing, does nothing, which I think is the right call. I mean, if these kids right. want to transfer somewhere else, it's whatever. In an age where NIL is so popular, where the parity in college football, to me, is getting better outside the top 10, which, again, conversation for another time, but everybody outside of that top 5 or 10 is beating up on one another, and now we're picking the most random little battles, the, the, the best kids, and saying, hey, no, nah, we don't think you should play. The inconsistency is the first thing that really drives me crazy. I don't know if they have, like, different arbitrators that all look at different cases, and maybe, maybe it's like which umpire you get at a baseball game, right? The strike zone is bigger or smaller depending on who it is reviewing your case. But, you know, to deny a young man, and, and Kenton was so right to describe the first-time transfer was because the football program was canceled, yeah. and the second-time transfer is to be closer to a sick family member, closer to home. It's like... How do you look at that and deny it? And I'm with you, Drake, like the Colorado thing, it doesn't upset me, but at the same time, the inconsistency does, mm. where you basically allow an entire roster to be built off transfers who are allowed to play immediately, mm. and then you decide to deny a young man a waiver under these circumstances. It's crazy. The other part about it that bothers me is, it's very obvious the NCAA, they're trying to flex what little power they have. Because 
they're losing control of their own sport, of their own athletic landscape, yep. right? Where, you know, they they hate not having really any control over name, image, and likeness, which takes a lot of control away from their recruiting rules. Uh, and so now it's like the little power that they have left. They need to show these players and these teams who's boss by flexing that power. It's it's very upsetting to me. And I know we, we had a little talk about this last week, but – you know, the years go on with, with the way that, you know, the conferences now and the universities are getting so much power. At a certain point, you're going to look at the NCAA and say, why do we need them again? Like yeah. exactly what do they actually do to make uh, to make our situation better? So that's where I'm at on this. It's troubling to me. Yeah. And, and we could sit and have this conversation for a half hour, Kenton, but nothing's going to happen. This yeah. is not going yeah. to change. And there, there are two things that I want to talk about real quick before we got to move uh, on from this. Number one. The NCAA doesn't realize this, but decisions like this are driving toward that singularity thing that Chip Kelly was talking about, where football is a separate entity altogether. Yeah, We are looking at a multi-billion dollar business, yep. and you're regulating where some of the stars can and can't go, when they can and can't play. I'm going to tell you this, in these great United States of America, in the mainland and in Hawaii and Alaska, if there's enough money behind it, it will find a way. It, what they say life finds a way, well, money finds a way in America, baby. And there's too much money in this thing for you for the NCAA to continue making these rules arbitrarily. And second of all, I'm I'm going to say this, and this is the NC State and me talking a little bit, and yeah. I'm going to be 100% honest about that. It is not right the way that this has garnered not only national, but the way that this has been treated locally. The way that we have the governor writing letters to the NCAA, the way that it's one of the biggest stories that's leading the sports block on uh, the Central North Carolina news stations, all that. Where was this energy for the other players in the state who had similar situations? When Chandler Zavala of NC State was told that he wasn't going to be able to play and he had only played three games and got hurt and didn't get an injury waiver, which literally the injury waiver says if you only if you play less than 16 quarters of football. Now, maybe it's just me. The two the three games that he did play, none of them went in overtime. We didn't get free football. So I don't understand how four times three became over 16. Nobody yeah. governor didn't write a letter for him, but he did for Tez Walker, who went to his alma mater. I didn't see WRL breathing down people's necks to talk about that. I didn't see none of the news states, ABC 11, WTV. Um, uh, I can't remember the other one. WNCN. Nobody was here talking about that. Cam Hayes going to ECU. Nobody's talking about that. Cam Woods going to NC State. Nobody's talking about that. And those players are in very similar situations where they're not going to get waivers either. Most likely. And for whatever reason, Tez Walker seems to be the spark plug that has got everybody around the nation swept up and wrapped up in it. Things that make you go, hmm. Yeah, he can't be the only one at this point. It's a, exactly. they're, they're so, and you mentioned in the very state. But look, while they're not covering, Locked On College Football Kickoff Live is covering it. And Kenton, you mentioned this is a, you and Donna both a multi billion dollar industry that we're talking about now. And one of the biggest brands in that the Texas Longhorns. One of the other biggest brands in that, the Alabama Crimson Tide, and they're taking on one another in Tuscaloosa this week. We heard the Bama side, but apparently this isn't your dad's Nick Saban. It's not the Crimson Tide we're used to. Let's get the other side of this game. Jonathan Davis of Locked On Longhorns here on College Football Kickoff Live. The Horns and the Alabama Crimson Tide this weekend in Tuscaloosa. Jonathan, why, if they can, why can Texas win this game? Because I think you're going into Tuscaloosa with a team that can match the talent level of the team you're playing, the Alabama Crimson Tide. And I think uh, Steve Sarkeesian said it perfectly in his media availability. You have to go in there and beat the 2023 Alabama Crimson Tide, right? You're not playing the Alabama Crimson Tide of the last 17 years, or the Nick Saban of the last 17 years, all of those coordinators and all of those players that have made you know, Alabama – uh, the class of college football. And I think when you look at this team, they're strong in the trenches. You know, obviously the offensive line didn't look great against Rice, but, you know, they certainly have the talent to go into Alabama and, you know, play really good football on the outside. You know, they have a ton of weapons at, uh, you know, wide receiver and tight end. They have a really good running back room. And that defense, although the offense didn't look great against Rice, the defense looked ferocious. So I think you have a ton of talent on this Texas football team. You have a great coaching staff and you have a team that's eager to win a big game like this and put themselves back on the map as a program. And so that's why they can go into Tuscaloosa and get the win because they have a ton of talent and a team that's hungry and ready to put themselves back with the blue bloods at the top of college football. 
Jonathan, uh, reluctantly, as the host of Locked On Big 12, which you are leaving, we will not be uh, fraternizing for very long. I, I sadly do have the Texas Longhorns beating Alabama, the gut feeling there. But my problem with this is the Texas offensive line, which was supposed to be so big and bad this year, was pretty meek and mild against Rice. And Quinn Ewers of 2023 looks a lot like Quinn Ewers of 2022, who just wasn't great. He was okay. Am I right there? Yeah, no, I, I think you saw some of the same things that I saw when I watched the tape. You know, fans yeah. were uh, a little anxious because I think they were coming out year three under Steve Sarkeesian and expecting the second coming of the 2020 Alabama offense. Yeah. And when you see your offense go out there and score one touchdown and uh, three field goals in the first half, I don't care how vanilla you've con convinced yourself Steve Sarkeesian was. That's just not acceptable. Now, they did come out, you know, the first three drives of the second half and score touchdowns. But it's fair to question if Rice was able to give Texas some trouble on the offensive side of the ball what can that defensive unit in Alabama do so yeah the offensive line is going to have to be a lot better it looks like we're going to have a different starting right guard which I think is the right decision mm -hmm. on Saturday and I think Quinn Ewers is going to have to have you know one of those type performances that we've seen beat Alabama over the years a Johnny Manziel uh, a Joe Burrow uh Trevor Lawrence a Deshaun Watson I hate bringing up his name but he's just one of the ones that came to mind but yeah. it's going to yeah. take one of those type performances from Quinn Ewers to win on Saturday, and I can't blame people for saying they haven't seen it for 11 games. What makes you think it'll happen in the 12th? Xavier Worthy, to me, will be, I'm going to say it, he'll be the best player on the field on Saturday night. I, I was way higher than him than a lot of the national media who left him off of All-American pages. I thought that was insane. I think Xavier Worthy is an All-American caliber wide receiver. Does it take a two-touchdown, 100-yard performance from him, something spectacular from him or somebody else on the offense for Texas to win? Absolutely, yeah. And I think that, you know, you could say it's going to take a great performance uh, from the running backs, but when you look at B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson not being able to run the ball on Alabama yeah. last year, it's hard to say, okay, well, Jonathan Brooks and Cedric Baxter will, right, when we know how much talent, uh, you know, B. John Robinson has. Like I said, I think it's going to take – uh, you know, a Heisman type performance, a generational legendary type performance yeah. from Quinn Ewers. And if he's doing that with his arm, that means somebody has to be doing it, catching the ball. And I think Xavier Worthy is the most likely candidate for that. We know in Steve Sarkeesian's offense, he wants to stretch the defense. He wants to get down the field and nobody does that better probably in the entire conference in the Big 12 yeah. than Xavier Worthy. So I think that, you know, if uh, Quinn Ewers is to have a big game and have a game capable of beating this Alabama team, then that means Xavier Worthy probably got past Kool-Aid McKinstry a few times for touchdowns. What does a win in this game on Saturday mean for the University of Texas? Yeah, I think, you know, I said this on an episode with our Locked On SEC hosts and our Locked On Bama hosts. A lot of people in that building looking for validation, right? You know, I think mm -hmm. Steve Sarkeesian, uh, we know what he is as an offensive play caller and play designer, but, you know, he's kind of close to 500 as a head coach, 14 and 12 at the University of Texas. I think this would be his signature win. We talked about Quinn Ewers a little bit off the record, right? I think, you know, 12 games later, we're still waiting to see what we saw at South Lake Curl. We're still waiting for him to live up to the hype. This could be that validation for him and for a team – that is in the blue bloods, a team that you can't tell the story of college football without the last 10 years. They have not lived up to expectations. The last 10 years, they have been the laughing stock of college football. Yeah. This would validate them as being back on their way, at least to being one of the top programs in the sport. So a lot it, of people in Austin, Texas, looking for validation on Saturday. And if they win, you know, I think a lot of them will get it. You did say the word back. You slipped it in there. You put some other words around it, but I did hear the word back somewhere in your response for Texas winning this game. Uh, Jonathan, when it when it comes to that 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 conversation of Texas, so, you know, Texas is back if they beat Alabama. This is the best team on the UT schedule all year. That's not an argument. If if the Longhorns win this game, is it 12 and 0 or bust? No, I don't think if the Longhorns win this game, it's 12-0 and or bust. I think you came into the season saying that you needed to win a Big 12 championship and at least compete for the college football playoff. I think, you know, whether you win or lose this game, you know, that that goal is still in reach. And, you know, it's hard, you know, when you're going out there and, you know, teams are competing against you as a competition and they're trying to win as well. So I'm not going to sit here and say because they beat Alabama, they should go out there and win 10 straight games, you know, but as long as they uh, get to the Big 12 championship game and win it or at least put together a very good effort, then, yeah, I think that's the goal at the end of the season, regardless of what happens on Saturday. You don't want to go out there and, you know, start smelling yourself if you beat Bama, right? Because yeah, what we've yeah. seen from Texas is the type of team that'll beat Bama and then lose to that Baylor product we saw against Texas State two weeks after. Jonathan, final score prediction. 
my final score prediction 27 21 the alabama crimson tide unfortunately for my texas fans listening i just think t- uh, both teams are very evenly matched but i think we're on the road in front of a hundred thousand people and we talked about those offensive inconsistencies against yeah. rice it could be sark holding back the play calling but i think i saw a little bit more than that on the tape offensive line a little shaky quinn you was not doing well adjusting to the pressure and he's going to face a ton of it on saturday night and i think Jalen milrow will struggle a little bit on all uh alabama side but he has that superpower of being able to take off for 40, 50 yards whenever he wants and score a touchdown. And I think that'll be the difference. So I think Alabama wins the battle in the trenches. I think Jalen Milrow makes a few more splash plays and Alabama wins 27 to 21 on Saturday night. Unfortunately, take the, under, take the horns plus seven. That's Jonathan Davis locked on Longhorns. Yes, sir. Hook him. Guys, quick reaction to Texas and Alabama. I think. Xavier Worthy proves to be the best player on the field. Texas keeps it close, and the experience wins in the end. I have Texas taking this game by three points, Alex Dono. I feel crazy saying it, but I agree with you. Texas is going to win this game. You know, obviously, you try not to dwell too much on what happened between the teams last year, but they've each only played one game, so it's hard not to. Texas, since last season, has gotten better on paper. I know they were a little sloppy against Rice. They've gotten better on paper. Alabama, I think, has gotten a little bit worse on paper. And, you know, their their quarterback struggles during spring and fall camp were well documented. Jalen Milrow, for as good as he played uh, against Middle Tennessee, I'm not going to come out and say, oh, you know what, he's the second coming, everything's fixed. I think he's going to have some struggles against Texas. I think Quinn Ewer's experience, and listen, before he left that game injured last year, he was carving up the Alabama secondary. Uh, feels crazy to say it out loud, but I, I've got Texas winning this game on the road. Close game, but I've got the Longhorns. Hmm. Kenton, I I don't know what's happening. I feel like I'm in <laughs> bizarre world. The SEC is struggling. <laughs> They're struggling. LSU got no boss. They got tapped out. You look at at uh, you look at the the USC team. Negative rushing yards against the UNC defense that couldn't stop yeah. the run with Robitussin, a COVID shot, and tissue. And and that team gives you negative yards. I don't know what's happening. Now we're picking Texas over Bama. I hate to be on the bandwagon. I know some SEC folks are going to be mad at us. I know Zach and Brandon are backstage saying, cut his mic, cut his mic. <laughs> but, baby, I, I got to say it. Texas wins this game. And I want to say something about Texas being back. Jeez. From 1999 through 2009, Texas had as many national championship appearances as they had seasons with single-digit wins. Those two single-digit win seasons were nine. Folks, stop saying Texas is back until you no longer have to ask if they're back. They're not back until you don't have to ask the question anymore. If you're talking about those Mac Brown glory days, you're not back until there's no more questions. The question is, should this team be on the field with Texas? That's when you're back. That's when you're back, buddy. Well, let just, me add one thing in because Kenton, this doesn't have to be an SEC versus somebody else conversation. I mean, the SEC they can basically already claim Texas. If Texas true, wins that true. game, the SEC can say, "Hey, they're going to be with us next year." SEC versus SEC, so I don't think they'll lose any sleep over that. In the words of Kobe Bean Bryant, "Soft, soft. They're <laughs> not yours yet. They're not there yet." Okay, that's uh, just because the marriage is arranged doesn't mean that the. the that's your partner in the house cooking up the food, balancing the budget and the check. But yeah, they're not yours. That's the Big 12 whooping on you. Don't be soft, SEC. <laughs> Don't claim them yet. They still got to pay a payout ticket to the Big 12 to leave. Don't be soft. This is SEC Big 12. What are you going to do about it, SEC? I don't, guys, we just all three picked Texas to win against Alabama on the road. They're going to pull our show before next week. Yeah, all three of us yeah. going Texas over Alabama. Coming up next, it's another powerhouse team like Bama that still has a lot of question marks. It's, it's Ohio State. Can, can they go to the college football playoff? But first, Dono. I remember when buying last-minute tickets to sporting events used to be a stressful experience. Ugh, I don't know if I'm getting a deal. Am I getting ripped off? Guys, at game time, you are always getting a deal. You're never getting ripped off. They've got these flash deals on last minute tickets it's easy to find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area sporting events concerts i'm taking my five-year-old to disney on ice tomorrow i got great deals at game time lowest price guarantee the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price if you find tickets in the same section and row for less 
Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference, guys. So download the Game Time app, create an account, and use our code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Well, wow, Dono, I didn't know you're taking Billy Napier to Disney on Ice. That's awesome, <laughs> guys. Uh, Hi, Billy, he's coming with me. <laughs> Last week it was USC. This week. It's Ohio State. We're talking playoff contenders, but a whole new look for Ryan Day's squad. Let's get a closer look at Ohio State. Jay Stevens of Locked On Buckeyes here on the college football kickoff live every Friday. Uh, Jay, let's talk Ohio State and the playoff chances for a team that Played in a football game on Saturday, 23-3 to against Indiana. Um, interesting we're having this conversation just a couple of days removed from whatever that was. Yeah, it's weird, man. That game there, I was there, and I am still kind of baffled by what we saw from Ryan Day, the offense. Expected a little bit more. Expected them to not be conservative. Offensively, I, my expectations were higher to see yeah. better play from them than what we got. However, on defense, buddy, you hold any opponent to only three points. I don't care if it's a Big Ten opponent, FCS, it don't matter. You're doing something right, especially when the opposition is running a triple option, which you really didn't spend much time practicing that week leading up to the game. Got to give it to the defense because they really showed up and played Buckeye football like we expected them to. Yeah, when I look at the highlights, when I go back and watch this game and see the way Kyle McCord played, he played like a guy who's starting his first ever game at quarterback for Ohio State uh, in a Big Ten game, too. This wasn't, he didn't get a Southeast Missouri in game one. He got another Big Ten team. How do you assess his performance on Saturday? Looks like a guy that's starting. Now, he wasn't his first start. He started, I think, a year ago or two years ago against Akron, but his first Big Ten start, which is also on the road. So it's like, Context is one thing. Akron's one opponent, a G5 school. Indiana's a Power 5, Big 10 school. It's still on the road to, like, it's still tough. It's very, yeah. very tough, especially with the way Indiana's defense played. Their front seven played a whole lot better than expected. Uh, number 44, Casey, and some other guys, uh, Moore, number 20. They were making plays all day, making things hard for the Buckeyes' offense. McCord looked like somebody who really kind of making his first start or first Big 10 start, Yeah, but there's – there are ways for McCord to get better, like easy ways. I'm not talking about like, a hey, bro, like you need to f- try to make do a better job of working through your progression. Like, yes, that's a thing as a quarterback. But I think some of the throws that he missed that were either yeah. low or high or um, just outside of the outstretched arms of a receiver, those things can be fixed. We would have a different view on McCord's performance if he had some of those throws that were off, one to Fleming over the middle, one to Harrison Jr. that got called back due to Harrison Jr. stepping out of bounds, if those two throws are completions, we're looking at McCourt's performance a whole lot different yeah. than we are now. The numbers are one thing. The play is another. But also, I do think when you put all that together, McCourt's quarterback, who is starting week two, and I do believe is the right guy going forward to start week three, start against Notre Dame, and beyond. Jay Stevens is not falling for the overreaction Monday that everybody get. You know, backup quarterback's always the most popular guy in town after week one, Jay. But this Ohio State team, Ryan Day, if they're going to make the college football playoff again this season, what has to go right? And and is this a playoff caliber roster? Roster, yes. I think it's easily a playoff caliber roster. I don't think there's any question about that or any doubt in my mind that this roster is a playoff caliber roster. I think a lot of things happen to go have, have to look at the offense. That was not the conversation most people were having going into the season. But listeners are locked on Buckeyes realized that the defense I thought would be okay. Offensively, new quarterback, what's the running back rotation? And even in week two, I know what I think it should be. I don't know if the coaches have it set in stone what it will be Saturday against Youngstown State. Receivers, you got to get those guys involved. Three of your five starting offensive linemen, they're new you're going to have some growing pains early in the season. We saw those week one. And so I do think for the Buckeyes to make the playoff once again, a lot of questions are on the defense. Excuse me, the offense. Defensively, I think they'll be fine. I think they'll be one of the surprising units in the Big Ten, maybe in the entire country. 
with how uh, fundamentally sound they are week in and week out. But a lot of it goes to how quickly do you get things fixed with quarterback? How quickly does the offense get and stop playing conservative football? Do you beat Notre Dame? If you don't beat Notre Dame, your chances of going to the playoff go down drastically because you got Penn State at home. That week after, I do believe it's Wisconsin on the road. You got Michigan on the road in Ann Arbor. You got a Maryland team, and their defense is playing better than advertised. The Buckeyes' schedule, it's not the easiest this year. Look at the offense. The Buckeyes mm-hmm. want to get to the playoff. That offense has to play better. So, Jay, what you just pitched me is this schedule is really tough when it comes to trying to win enough games, the right games, to make college football playoff. Because, look, if you beat everybody else but lose to Maryland, you're, you're, you're still in. You yeah. still got a shot at this thing. So where do you stand right now? Does Ohio State make the college football playoff in 2023? Ooh, before the season, I said yes. And I don't think I've seen enough ball to change my mind. I do think the Buckeyes make the playoff this year. Uh, I just think this, talent, this roster is too talented. And I do think over the next few weeks, I say few, I do think you're going to see something special from Ohio State against Notre Dame. And I don't know exactly why I think that. Because based off one game, I don't have a reason to think that. But my gut tells me the offense will not be a well-oiled machine, but will be a whole lot better. The running backs will be a whole lot better. They'll start targeting the two receivers that are future potential first-round picks. So I do think by Notre Dame week, the game plan is going to be tweaked drastically. The defense will play a whole lot better. Um, The rotations will get tighter for that game. Because in that game in South Bend, if you win that game on the road, night game on NBC – you're telling the world, hey, we know what happened week one. We know we got two lesser opponents week two and week three. But this is Buckeye football. And Buckeye football shows up on the road and wins big games. So, yeah, I still have them in the playoff. That can change over the next few weeks, but I have not seen enough ball to change my prediction. Yeah, you're seeing a team grow up in real time here, Jay. And a lot a lot of these playoff hopefuls, Georgia, another need progression over the course of the season. We'll see if Ohio State can keep up with it. Jay, thanks for joining College Football Kickoff Live. No problem. Uh, I hope that Jay Stevens narrates my life when they, if they write a book, (laughs) I hope it's Jay Stevens that narrates it. Guys, we have looked around the Big Ten. We've seen the Pac-12 and the Sun Belt. It is time for the big dogs. Let's go conference confidential. And we start with, oh, wait a second. Something, uh, there's a weird little thing in the script here. It says, knock, knock. Hey, who's there? Get it? Because uh, uh, the Big 12, that's who's there. It's, it's kind of a big week for us, to be honest with you over here, because last week was so bad. If you're in the Big 12 and you have TCU, Embarrassed, Texas Tech Embarrassed, Baylor Embarrassed, West Virginia Embarrassed, you're going to need some kind of momentum this week. Luckily, you get it with Texas and Alabama. Two sides of this coin. On the one side, Big 12. I hope Texas wins. On the other side, SEC. If Texas wins, that's an SEC win against an SEC team, and it gives them momentum. But then again, if Texas beats Alabama, and then Kansas State beats Texas, or TCU beats Texas, what does that do for the Big 12? That's a lot to digest this week. I do think Texas wins in Tuscaloosa. Baylor, Utah. Utah was originally favored by four, over under 47. Now that spread is eight. I think Baylor covers the eight with a Mike Leach quarterback and Sawyer Robertson starting this week. Give me the Bears. Covering at home against the Pac-12 champions at 11 a.m. Big opportunity for the Big 12 to show its prowess over the Pac-12. Kansas, three-point favorites against Illinois. Illinois struggled with Toledo. Give me the Jayhawks. Iowa State, Iowa. Iowa's going to win this game. They have a very good defense. Oh, under 36 and a half. Take the under. Iowa minus four covers, though. The final score, 20 to 13. Uh, SMU, Oklahoma. Who cares? Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, I guess since he, you know, Emory Jones is not that bad of a quarterback. So if you're a Pittsburgh fan, you think, oh, easy win. Not so fast, my friend. Not so fast, my friend. Cincinnati's got a couple of All-Americans, one of the defensive line, uh, defensive line. So I, I think they give them a run for the money. Pitt probably wins the game. Oregon, Texas Tech, another great opportunity for the Big 12 to prove that it belongs. It's better than the Pac-12. I think the Texas Tech uh, probably lose to Oregon, but it's going to be a great game. Over under 69. Nice. Uh, UCF and Boise, big game. Oklahoma State, Arizona State. That's the last game that I'll preview here. Uh, Oklahoma State will beat Arizona State by 45 points for once to in Tempe. They are three-point favorites. Hammer that. Huge week in the Big 12 to bounce back from last week's debacle. Big 12, 
going to have a big one. What's happening, everybody? Chris Gordy here from Locked On SEC. We got some big non-conference games in week two for the SEC. We start with number 20, Ole Miss at number 24, Tulane. A danger spot here for Lane Kiffin, the Ole Miss Rebels. Tulane quarterback Michael Pratt was near perfect last week in that win over South Alabama. Ole Miss, they hung 73 on Mercer last week, but this will be a much tougher test. Uh, Yulman Stadium is going to be loud. It's a small stadium, but... Those New Orleans fans are going to be drunk and uh, fired up. And uh, look, danger spot here for Ole Miss. I think Ole Miss wins in a close one. Quinchon Judkins in that run game wear them down in the second half. But keep in mind, Tulane is just a few months removed from beating the Heisman Trophy winner Caleb Williams and USC in the Cotton Bowl. So a dangerous spot there for Ole Miss. Next up, we got number 23, Texas A&M at Miami. Tough early test for the Aggies. They passed the smell test in week one with a ton of offense against New Mexico. The Bobby Petrino experiment appears to be working, but I almost consider this a must win for Jimbo Fisher in week two. If they lose this game, guess what's going to happen? You're going to start hearing talk of the buyout money again. Oh, the Petrino experiment's not working. What are they going to do? I think A&M wins, and I think they cover the four points out there in uh, at Miami. I just feel like Connor Wegman looked so much better last week. Five touchdown passes. I think he had all of eight last year. A uh, much be- better, much improved Texas A&M team. I think they get it done in Miami. Uh, Auburn is out at Cal. That one's intriguing. We get to see what Hugh Freeze has in store going out to the West Coast. Jaden Otte, Cal running back, talking some trash this week about Auburn. But I think the Tigers get it done, especially if they're running back Jarquez Hunter is back out there this week for Auburn. And then lastly, the game of the week, it is Texas at Alabama, a rematch of the game last year where Alabama gutted out a 20-19 to win, but Bryce Young is gone. Enter Jalen Milrow. We saw him look really good last week as the new Alabama quarterback, but it was against Middle Tennessee State. What does he look like against the speed of Texas? Going to be interesting, especially that Alabama defense going up against uh, those Texas receivers, Quinn Ewers, he was having a day before he got knocked out of that game a year ago. So a uh, big, big game here for Alabama. I think they get it done at home as a seven-point favorite in Tuscaloosa. Look, Nick Saban's only lost five games at home since 2010, and three of those were special Heisman performances when you consider Johnny Manziel, Cam Newton, and Joe Burrow. If Quinn Ewers plays Heisman-level football, they'll pull off the upset, but I think Alabama wins and wins at home. Guys, the only conference we're missing here, the ACC. Kenton Gibbs, what do you like over the well, East Coast? Well, I, I know that y'all, you know, didn't get the ACC's uh, uh, conference confidential because y'all wanted to hear me and Donald talk about this thing on there since we got two ACC guys here. But let me tell you this. This, by all accounts, should be, should be a boring week, right? We've only got four games in the entire conference that have single-digit lines. You're looking at Virginia Tech, Purdue. You're looking at uh, UVA, James Madison. You're looking at Miami, Texas A&M. And you're looking at Pitt and Cincy. Now, with that being said, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot NC State and Notre Dame in there as well. Five. But that's that's it, right? With that being said, I'd be a liar if I told you I'm 100% certain that all of these things hold. I mean, yeah. we had an NIU team that was terrible. Walk into Boston College's trap and take over their trap. That was just embarrassing. And, th- and so... We look around and we say, well, can Boston College beat Holy Cross? We want to say yes, but are we sure of that? You know what I mean? There, there's a lot going on there. And then even with these games that do have the single-digit lines, of course, you're looking at a chance for one of the most monumental upsets in recent NC State history in beating a Notre Dame team that's coming into your house and trying to take food out of your fridge. What are you going to do about it? Virginia Tech headed up to Purdue. What's going on there? What is this team going to look like? Does Pride finally have them together? Can Grant Wells do something? I'll tell you what. I said about the ODU and Virginia Tech game, the team with Ali Jennings will win the game. I'm going to say the same thing about this one. The team with Ali Jennings will win the football game. That's a bad man, that receiver. And the only thing stopping him from being in a Belitnikoff conversation is Grant Wells and, and health. That's it. Those are the only two things that are going to stop him there. Virginia JMU, the best team in the state of Virginia will win. I'm talking about the James Madison Dukes. They will win that football game. I have faith in them to cover that six and a half. We've already talked about Miami, Texas A&M, but Pitt Cincy could get real yeah. spicy. Yep. That could get real interesting. You've got uh, Scott Satterfield, a guy who's no stranger to the ACC, last stop was at Louisville, now coaching against Pitt in this game where we're finally going to get to see, well, 
you know, the last time Pitt had a quarterback, what happened? They were the last ever coastal team to win an ACC championship. It looks like Narduzzi and the boys got themselves a goer in uh, in Phil Dracovic, who's returning home. So the question is, can they beat Cincinnati and can they blow out this seven-point spread? I think they can. Yeah, Dono, any reason to have an eye on that game or another game over the one occurring at Hard Rock? Uh, well, you know, also, um, I think North Carolina is going to win, but it's always interesting when a Power 5 team matched up against Appalachian State is yeah. favored by 19 points because we know how that narrative for the Mountaineers has gone over the years, what they did Every to time. Texas Former A&M. Former Michigan fan yeah. here. I've seen it. So, so, it's all, so you look at that, it's like, yeah, is UNC the better team? Is, is Drake May one of the top quarterbacks in the country? Yes, but you know the Mountaineers have that kind of history. But And I also, listen, two of the biggest games, I think, on the schedule this weekend involve ACC teams, right? We've talked about Notre Dame, NC State. Obviously, I'm going to be all invested, and I'll be at the game at Hard Rock Stadium between uh, Miami and Texas A&M. And th- that's a really spicy one, guys, because, you know, Chris Gordy, by the way, his bobblehead collection is everything. I was in oh, awe wow. of that. But he fairly brought up the Jimbo Fisher narratives because he, he's been mm-hmm. in College Station, what is this, year seven for him at College Station, Texas. And if they if they don't pull off that win at Hard Rock Stadium, folks are going to start talking about that buyout. I don't think there's quite as much pressure on Miami, but it's year two for Mario Cristobal. Year one was uh, pretty humiliating at five and seven, as was Texas A&M's year last year. Both teams went five and seven last year. So there's definitely pressure for Miami to to look good at home, win the game if they can. And I believe they can win that game. But obviously, for as negative as the Jimbo narratives would be if Texas A&M lose, uh, there would definitely be some Mario Cristobal narratives down in my neck of the woods if the Hurricanes lose that game and, and look bad doing it. So I think there's a lot of pressure on both sides. Yeah. Dono, uh, I let's go to hot seats around college athletics because uh, I've avoided this conversation due to the whole Dave Aranda thing and the Baylor Bears. We got to go there first, though, from Nutrafol. Dono. Yes, Nutrafol, my friends. Thinning hair does not have to be your fate, guys. Nutrafol is doing amazing things. If you're tired of that weakening or thinning hair and you want to reach that full hair potential, leading hair growth supplement, Nutrafol, Helps you improve your hair growth, visible thickness, and visible scalp coverage. Nutrafol's hair growth supplements use physician-formulated, natural, science-backed ingredients. Their drug-free, patented technology provides consistent, reliable results without compromising your sexual health, guys. Nutrafol supports healthy hair growth from within by targeting root causes of thinning hair. Take the first step to visibly thicker, healthier hair. Because for a limited time, Nutrafol is offering our listeners $10 off your first month subscription and free shipping when you go to Nutrafol.com slash men and enter promo code Locked On College. Find out why over 4,000 healthcare professionals recommend Nutrafol for healthier hair. Nutrafol.com slash men uh, with the promo code Locked On College. That's Nutrafol.com slash men, promo code Locked On College. Funniest thing, Kenton, uh, Billy Napier just sent me a LinkedIn request. That's it's, mm-hmm. it's a very updated profile, it seems. Mm-hmm. Uh, who else is updating their LinkedIn this week? Oh, well, let's start with the ACC uh, since that's where we ended the last segment. Jeff Halfley, brother, update that LinkedIn. Yeah. Go ahead and let people know. Put that little open to work banner. Go ahead because – Boston College has, you know, they haven't held the same as when Adazio was there. They haven't held the same from when Tom O'Brien was there. They have objectively regressed. Boston College, here's a fun fact about Boston College. They have never lost to UConn nor a group of five team previous to uh, Halfley's arrival. Yeah. I'm sorry, not FCS, a, a group of five. Yeah, group of five in UConn. So, yeah, that's, and he lost to both in back to back years, scoring three points against UConn. Uh, Halfley, brother, go ahead. You know, just, hey, listen, I'm going to tell you this. Athletic director, Mr. Blake, you go ahead. Post, put that purple hiring uh, banner on your profile. Because we know in search of head coach qualifications must be a winner. We know. We know. We know what's coming. So let's just go ahead and get the formalities out the way. Get the pleasantries out the way. Tell them, hey, Jeff, it's been real. It's been fun, but it ain't been real fun, brother. Go ahead and hit the road jacket. Don't you come back. No more, no more, no more, no more. Uh, Dono, who do you got? Where, who's feeling the heat for you? 
Well, listen, you stole a little bit of my thunder when you brought up G5 Billy Napier. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> they muted him. Did, did they, our production they, they muted him. Yeah, production our... muted. We have a Florida. We have uh, the host of Locked On Florida part of our production team, so that's why he got muted. Go ahead, Donald. Oh, so okay. you. He we already knows. And listen, I, I don't I, – I, just just get yourself familiar with LinkedIn jobs, Billy, because I, I think yeah. G5 Billy's going to get a little bit more time there. He's going to get into year three. <laughs> Dono, it's weird. Your mic's truth. not working. Yeah, they can't mute the truth, Dono. Tell the truth on them. Tell them folks the truth. Bullying uh, is working on me in this case because I also want to remind folks that I don't know. I don't know if Dabo Sweeney even knows what the internet is because he's so behind on everything else when it comes to to NIL recruiting policies. But if someone can direct Dabo to a computer you might want to at least complete a LinkedIn profile, okay? Right, just just complete right. that profile because if the Tigers don't get back on track after getting blown out by Duke, he might need to spruce up that resume a little bit and log on to LinkedIn jobs. <laughs> now, wait a minute. In Dabo's defense, and I hate to say this because right, you're making me defend Dabo all yeah. willy-nilly. That, yeah. that hurts my pride. I'm supposed to, Friday's supposed to be a good day for me, Dono. Friday's supposed to be a great day, but here you go. Got me defending Dabo. Dabo has a the type of lease where he can afford one actual down year. Because yeah. last year, everybody said, oh, that's a down year. No, 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 no. That was a down year for Clemson. That wasn't actually a down year. Double-digit wins, New Year's Six Bowl, Conference Championship, that's not a down year. Now, he can afford one. If, he, if they go like five and seven, six and six, something like six and seven or whatever this year, he'll be okay. You do that again. And uh, don't worry about it. You know, he don't even got to update his LinkedIn. Just go on down there and uh, try coaching those receivers at Tuscaloosa for a while. You know, I know that they got a, a carousel of former great coaches that are about to get turned back out. So that may be Dabo's fate. But I think for now, his seat is a little warm, but I'm yeah. not ready to say it's hot. You know, some of these coaches, their seats are hot as fish grease. I'm looking at you up in Minnesota. They ain't, they ain't liking rowing the boat, brother. You, if your show improves something against uh, the, the the teams you got coming up here, you know you're gonna be looking at some problems. So wow. I'm just saying, throw a little PJ Fleck out there. Yeah, Fleck got to get it. Fleck got to be in on it. I I want to. Uh, I don't know how to react. How often do you see a head coach cry on the sidelines in the middle of a game? Yeah. I mean, there's the one human side of me that thinks, guys, probably going through the ringer right now. And then the other side that thinks that ah, we can't do that. We, can't, no. we yeah. cannot cry uh, on our sideline. Butch Jones at Arkansas State yeah. Um, yeah. actually took a shot at Tennessee fans this week. He was like, oh, yeah, all the pressure on me is not even coming from our fan base. It's coming from effectively he, he insinuated Tennessee. It's like, Butch, everything you could say, <sighs> you have just done a terrible job. And you cried on the sidelines in a 73 to nothing loss. Um, him and Neil Brown are tied for the hottest seat, though Neil is so fired that he doesn't have to cry. He's just like, ah, all right. I, I, all right. Where am I going to be? Where am I going to be next? Uh, and then maybe the greatest jaunt into the hot seat conversation of all time, Dave Aranda, just mm-hmm. not there. And then this week it's like, oh, well, I guess I got to fire him. In the span of 24 hours, it went from, ah, guys want a sugar bowl and a big 12 championship. What are we talking about? To, Oh, this could be a one in five start. Dave Aranda's gone. Jeff Grimes, the offensive coordinator, is the new interim head coach. And the Big 12 has a couple of guys that are fired after this season. What seemed like a one seat, hot seat conference is now two after Dave Aranda lost to Texas State. But guys, it's time to whip around some of the poppiest, biggest headlines at all of college football. We'll take you around the nation with our czar of locked on college. We have Heisman. Do we do we have a Heisman front runner already? Is it is it over in Colorado? Zach Blackerby, let's go. It's a Blackerby Blitz on College Football Kickoff Live. Zach Blackerby, host of Locked On Auburn, also the I don't know the 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 savant of the College Channel. Ooh. Zach, co- yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, checks, checks in the mail. Colorado yep. knocks off TCU this week. Did Deion Sanders just prove that you can take 70 kids out of the transfer portal and win now? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Now he's got to do it consistently. And it wasn't just 70 kids. It was 60-something kids and Travis Hunter. I mean, that, that guy 
counts as like 10 players with the amount of snaps he's going to play and how sustainable is that over the course of the season? I don't know. But right now, I, I think you can make the case that Travis Hunter deserves the Heisman. That, that, that's kind of where I'm sitting with him right now. Uh, wow. All right. Well, we can give Travis Hunter or TJ Finley the Heisman Woo! because TJ Finley, the old Auburn kid, put it on the Baylor Bears, a team that won the Big 12 and the Sugar Bowl now two years later, lost at home to Texas State, giving the Bobcats their first ever Power 5 victory. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, didn't work out at LSU for TJ Finley. Didn't work out at Auburn for TJ Finley. But maybe him going to Texas State was the key to unlocking his potential. Because he's been there all along. The guy's ginormous. He's got the arm. I think he's got the attitude. But, man, that was uh, that was wild. And, hey, Drake, a lot of people were saying that he was going to be the third-string quarterback or at least the backup when he transferred there. So props yeah. to him for winning that battle and then taking it to the Baylor Bears. And uh, you know a few things about that team. I do. I, 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 well, I was in the house um, for a historic, historic upset. It was either him or Malik Hornsby. So a great transfer class at Texas State. Again, sure. proving that you'd rather have 30 juniors in college from a different school than 30 freshmen in, yeah. in a recruiting cycle now in college football. Zach will take it to Ames, Iowa, where the uh, where half of the Iowa State football team is no longer on the football team due to a betting scandal where some were even betting on games they were playing in, including former starting quarterback Hunter Deckers. What do you make of, of college kids betting on their own games? I mean, it seems like it was so widespread within their locker room. How does somebody not step up and say, hey, guys, one, not only is this wrong, this is very illegal and much bigger than just football. Uh, it's just amazing. I mean, nobody stepped up and said anything, Drake, that there was some kind of like culture of betting within the locker room. Very corrupt, very stupid. Let's just be very clear here how dumb this is. And yeah, it's really wrecked the program that already wasn't in the best spot anyway. Now, if you are not a college football player, you can go to FanDuel, which is a proud betting sponsor and partner <laughs> of the Locked On Podcast Network. That's right. <laughs> Zach, Caleb Williams' dad came out this week and said that if he's drafted number one overall and doesn't like where he's going, he'll just come back to college and make even more money through NIL. What do you think about the old John Elway story coming back? Well, uh, he's getting money what from Nissan because of the Heisman house. He's getting money from Dr. Pepper. It seems like that, uh, that commercial is on my TV every time a football game goes to a commercial break. So I'm sure he's being well taken care of. And I think this is some of the beauty of NIL. I think we saw it most impact college baseball when a lot of guys chose to not go play in the minors for 20 grand a year, when instead they can make 20 grand a year and also have all this access, you know, to the college facilities. I think you're going to see some guys say, no, my gig right now is better than if I were to go to the NFL. And I think you're going to see it more in the later rounds. It's kind of interesting seeing it with a potential number one overall pick. But when you win the Heisman, you get that cheddar from more than just your school's collective, Drake. And I, and I think, I don't know if he's going to necessarily make more in college, but look, I don't know if I'd want to go play for the Cardinals either. So I, I do not blame Caleb Williams if this is all true. Well, look at Shadur Sanders at Colorado. He he gets the win at quarterback, yeah. and now he's multi-millionaire through NIL, making more money than Joe Burrow's base this season. Does that show, hey, look, we're, we're at an age, the longer you stay in college, the better if you're that guy. Yeah, if you're that guy, it's all about, you know, the name, image, and likeness. I think NIL shifted to, you know, almost some pay for, pay for play with all these collectives popping up. But it is more than that. At the, at the core of it, it is still about NIL. And these folks that are making a lot of money, I cover Auburn, Suni Lee, you know, the best gymnast in the world. She's a gold medalist, you know, for the most recent Olympics. She made a ton of money, but it really wasn't from Auburn. It was from Dancing with the Stars and, yeah. and all these other big brands that, that partnered with her. And if you're that big, you know, you deserve that sort of money. And you probably have more freedom to do that at the college level than you would in the NFL. Couple more, Zach. We'll take you back out to the South. The uh, Clemson Tigers got Yikes. drubbed by the Duke Blue Devils. Yikes. Uh, and Dabo is in Spain without the S. What do we do about Dabo Sweeney? Uh, I think you got to start asking the question if he doesn't have the best quarterback in the country, 
How good of a coach is he actually? I mean, this is a guy who had loaded teams with Taj Boyd, and uh, he was throwing to guys like uh, DeAndre Hopkins and yep. Arkevius Bryant, I believe, was on that team as well. DeAndre um, or Andre Ellington, and they couldn't get it done with that roster. But yeah. hey, Trevor Lawrence was really, really good. Deshaun Watson was really, really good. Kind of makes you wonder if he doesn't have the best quarterback in college football, how good of a coach is he? Uh, Chad Morris is on staff. That's that's all you need to know. Is that oh my gosh, why do Morris, people keep hiring him? It doesn't make any sense. Offensive assistant at Clemson. Uh, last but not least, you sent me this name incorrectly when you texted it to me. It's not Jaden Ott, it's Jaden Ott of Cal. The Bears said the name Auburn means nothing. Zach, it's your one Auburn headline of the week. I appreciate uh, are it. Are you are you fearful of the Cal Bears this week? I'm not. I'm not. I'm actually less fearful after he's uh, kind of shooting <laughs> his shot. D does he not know that he plays for Cal? This is a team that hasn't had a winning conference record, I think, since 09. They haven't won a national championship since 1937. Like, what are we doing here? You play for Cal. You were just, like, not at a conference a week ago because nobody else wanted you. And you're having to stoop to the level of joining a conference where the rest of the schools are 12 hours away from you because you don't really have a say <laughs> in the matter. So we'll certainly see. It's going to be the latest kickoff in Auburn football history. You know, I think that may impact the Tigers, unfortunately. But, look, uh, I'm all for it. We're not going to get a whole lot of opportunities for this. ACC after dark. How about that? Gross. That's Zach Blackerby. Host of Locked On Auburn and the Savant, the Locked On College Football Podcast, right here on College Football Kickoff Live. Wouldn't you know that was me on Tuesday? And thanks to Nutrafol, this is me today. Uh, Kenton Gibbs, which of those headlines really sticks out to you? Well, let, let's forget about the headlines for a minute. Zach Blunt saying he wouldn't want to play, play for the Cardinals either. How much is locked on paying you, brother? I, yeah. I don't care how bad the Cardinals are. If they want to pay me number one draft big money, I'll get on a coconut and shake like a tree for it. If, I mean, i get on a tree and shake like a coconut for it if they, they needed me to. Had it a little backwards. You know, that type of money days and confuse you a little bit. Shakes you up. But um, the, the headline that was very interesting to me, and I hate to say this. I hate to, to make it about the, the Auburn thing because, you know, I don't want to give Zach the satisfaction, but I got to do it. Cal, what are you doing? A player from Cal trash talking to anybody? Brother, stop it. Stop it, okay? Unless you're talking like future earning potentials after school. Unless you're talking about, hey, we're going to start more startups than you quicker than you can think of. And even then, you might not want to talk that talk to Stanford. What are you doing, brother? You play at Berkeley. I 1,000% agree with Zach. You know, there are certain schools. Hey, sit there and eat your food. Cal yeah. is one of them. Not only did Cal have to go to a conference 12 hours away in the ACC, but Zach forgot to mention, they're taking a reduced cut. They're coming in literally saying that the ACC basically looked at y'all and said, well, it's 2 a.m. The bar's closing down and yeah. you're the only person left. Come on, I guess, you know, and, and I'm not saying we've all been there because some of us make better life decisions than that. I'm not going to say which side of that fence I'm on, but – but you never want to be there. You never want to be that person getting picked last. It's the ugliest and nastiest thing there is. And Cal ended up being that. So maybe, just maybe, maybe do something special beyond have uh, Deshaun Jackson on the cover of a game, what, a, over a decade ago yep. as, as your school's latest highlight in, in football? Just saying. Yeah. We are close, Kenton and Alex, to my favorite part of the show. And that's where we talk to our Locked On Bets guys, who uh, try, um, <laughs> at least. But before we get to that, Alex, it's, it's what, uh, 12.49 on a Friday? It feels like game time. It, it, it's always game time. Even on 12.49 on a Saturday, if your team hasn't played yet, you get those amazing last-minute ticket deals. Forget planning months in advance, guys. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. I used to get stressed out by the last-minute ticket experience. Now 
I embraced it. And the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. So download the game time app, create an account and use code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase terms apply again, create an account and redeem code locked on college for $20 off download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Guys, last week we laughed and laughed that the lock, the level two lock of the week was West Virginia plus 20 and a half. And West Virginia did not cover 20 and a half. We all had it right, but we take it back to our betting experts we heard earlier from Locked On Ole Miss host Stephen Willis on why he thought the Rebels would cover. And Lee Sterling, your boy Q, Locked On Bets, they see this matchup with Tulane and Ole Miss a little bit differently. What the fuck? WTF. How about a top 25 matchup between Ole Miss and Tulane? Both teams come in 1-0 on the young season. FanDuel.com line on this one. Ole Miss minus 7.5 versus Tulane. Break this one down for us, Lee. Yeah. Um, Tulane has been thinking about this game. It's what I call the circle game since they lost 61-21 to in 2021. Popular pick last week of handicappers around the country was for South Alabama to knock off Tulane. People don't realize Willie Fritz, amazing coach. He coaches these kids up. They don't get in trouble. They do it the right way. They develop, and they have a home field advantage. How about this? Last four seasons, they're 16-4, and 16-4 and four against the spread here at home, Ole Miss can't stop decent offenses. And when Michael Pratt, the two-lane quarterback, is healthy, he is one of the best college quarterbacks in the country. He's their emotional leader here, and it's going to be sold out. They built this small stadium, like 30-something thousand, and every seat will be sold. I, I think it's going to be a great game, but seven and a half points at home, way too much. I think Ole Miss escapes 34-31, but I'll take the points here in the green wave. Oh, man. Yeah, I love it. 30,000 people sell out. Yeah, that'll get Ole Miss here. Half the fans are going to be Ole Miss fans. My level five lock of the week. <laughs> I'll put my toe on it. Give me yeah. the Ole Miss Rebels minus six and a half. I think our entire panel is going to agree. So I mean, so, I already said it earlier, so I can't I can't disagree, Drake. I, I did say earlier I think Ole Miss covers. I think their talent is going to let them pull away in the fourth quarter. So do you put the toe back on if Mississippi State covers? Like, how does that I work? Do. I, I, I get know. a toe back. Can't okay, I get I, a toe back? I don't know if rigor mortis was set in in the toe by that point. And it'd be, I don't you even know, know what that means, Ken. Or, I don't even know you're using French words now. What are we doing here? Fair enough. This is America. I'll speak American. And I'm going to speak some very plain, locked on, level eight host talk here. The, <laughs> the truth is, the truth is, I don't know why our locked on bets guys want to cost these people money. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I don't know if they got an inside deal with FanDuel or something. Like, hey, we'll, we'll feed them bad info. <laughs> you know, y'all put a little extra in our pot. But boy, <laughs> I'll tell you what. I don't see, uh, again, is it possible? Is there a, a world in the multiverse where Tulane makes this that type of game? Sure. But I think the most likely outcome here is that Ole Miss, they, Tulane plays them close. They keep it close. But Ole Miss just pulls away late. And they pull away enough to where they come. Yeah, Dono, anything, any, I mean, this feels so, of all of the games they could have chosen. Can, can I go off and give you my own level 18 lock on a completely different game? Because you guys Please, talked about this somebody earlier. Somebody give me a level 18 lock. We need a level I, didn't get a chance lock. To, I didn't get a chance to jump in earlier when you guys were talking about the Georgia Ball State game. And mm -hmm. I would agree. I'm not betting on a 42 and a half point spread uh, yeah. in, in either direction in this case. But however, guys, however, if you look a little deeper into the fan duel numbers, I do think there is a certain bet where I find value in the Georgia Bulldogs, and that's the first half spread, minus 22 and a half. I see that one playing out, fellas, because, Kenton, you hit the yeah. nail on the head earlier when you talk about, you know, trying to go, you know, pick, picking a team to win a game by 43 points. 
you're assuming they don't call off the dogs. You're assuming they're, they're twos and threes and probably fourth stringers who get in that game keep scoring and that their fourth string defense doesn't take their foot off the gas. That is a fool's errand to try and pick the four-quarter spread for that game. But Georgia, they're going to have their starters in for at least a quarter for the better part of the first half. I, I think they're going to be up by more than 23 points at halftime. So I take Georgia minus 22 and a half for the first half spread. That is a level 18 lock. Yes. Yeah. I love it, guys. I, there are a few in the Big 12 that I really enjoy this week, like Kansas State hosting Troy. I don't think Troy's a bad Sunbelt team, but 16 and a half for a home team that I think could win the league. It's a it's it's one of those 11 a.m. snoozers that ends 31-14. I don't know if it's a total blowout, but they're at least going to cover 16 and a half. Um, and, and then I've started as a pick to part where where this league is the one game that i keep coming back to is alabama texas so if i if i truly if i do need to pick one game i i've lost my left pinky toe but it is on ice i have it right here if i need mm -hmm. if i can reattach it i will reattach it with my level 18 lock this week the texas longhorns plus seven some 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 say seven and a half i would wait till kickoff because it keeps moving in the bama direction I'm going Texas plus seven and a half. My left toe, rusted knife, once again in hand, tetanus shot in the other. Is <laughs> there it is. There it is. And look, you can see on, the, on my left foot, you can see my heels. I have been oh breaking those God. in the last few oh days. Uh, Kenton huh. Gibbs, what's, what's your lock of the week? Boy, I know that uh, Rex Ryan is excited to watch this show now. But um, so I, I don't have a level 18 lock. I'm not as confident as y'all, but I'll give you a level nine lock. By the way, for folks watching, this level one through three <laughs> lock, by the way. So these numbers that we're throwing out, completely, <laughs> completely know. fanatical, but that's where we are. I've, I've talked about the James Madison and Virginia game already, but I want to dig deeper into that. Last year, James Madison was the one of the best run-stopping teams in all of college football. The only team that stopped the run at a higher clip than them or better than they did last year was some uh, some team that plays uh, in Athena or or Athens or something like that, some Bulldogs or something. I don't know. They're not the Dukes. That's all I know. And that team is going to be looking at a Virginia team that, objectively speaking, the wide receiver talent isn't really there. The best thing that they've got is a running back, uh, is a running back core that's fairly deep and all that. And when I look at that matchup, I say to myself, Six and a half is generous because if yeah. if James Madison wins by a touchdown, they get this thing done. I'm going to give you a direct quote from Tony Elliott last week. Us playing this game is a win. That was his quote about playing against Tennessee last week. Literally, them fielding a team and, and playing a game was a win. And mind you, with the tragedy that happened, they had not played the last three, two or three games yeah. of the season. So I understand right. that. But with that being said, James Madison ain't going to feel sorry for you, buddy. That, that's not – there's no moral victories. There's no show up and we're happy for James Madison. James Madison goes show up and say, this is our state. We got to prove that this is our state, and we'll see the Dukes do more than put their Dukes up and win this one handily. I love it. Two-minute warning, guys. 30 seconds. Dono, your biggest take this weekend. My biggest take this weekend is that uh, I, I don't hear Miami getting a whole lot of respect. I mean, I guess it's not too surprised that the Locked On Aggies host is going to pick Texas A&M to cover yeah. – Chris Gordy, he's caping up for the SEC. He's got Texas A&M covering no problem. Um, I am really, really curious to see how that game between Miami and Texas A&M plays out at 3.30 p.m. tomorrow at Hard Rock Stadium. But, um, you know, this reminds me, we had a conversation about Colorado and all the new scholarship players. 30 seconds, Dono. They have. All right. Well, my, Miami's got a much different roster this year, and I think it's going to be a much, much different game. Kenton Gibbs, he cut into your time. 28 seconds. SEC, this is your weekend to redeem yourself out of conference. If y'all get embarrassed by the Power Five conferences you play again, y'all got to change the slogan. It can't just mean more if y'all are sitting up here losing to UNC, getting whooped on by Florida State, losing to Miami, losing to everybody and their mama, Utah, without Cam Rising. And don't cut me off, Brandon. You can't have that and say it means more. Boom, the Big 12. Texas Tech beats Oregon. Baylor beats Utah. Texas beats Alabama. The trifecta to cover up a terrible weekend last weekend, and I'm not biased. Neither is Alex Dono of Locked On Canes. Kenton Gibbs of, Kenton Gibbs of Locked On ACC. <laughs> and I'm Drake Toll of Locked On Big 12. This has been College Football Kickoff Live. Thank you for making your lunchtime listen every single Friday.